It is September 2019, 2018, excuse me, I'm a year ahead of time, time warp. Um, we've got a lot to accomplish this afternoon. We've got an awful lot going on. And so we're going to start by, I'm just going to take a minute, welcome everybody. Um, I want you to look, the first item on the agenda is the 2018-2019 committee work plan. Unless somebody wants to talk about it, it's pretty self-explanatory. We're going to be talking about uh, budget variables and levers are going to be on probably earlier than ever before. The regents have asked for that. And then we are going to take a month-by-month -month look at the um, uh, plan. The, the, um, uh, where is it on there? The uh, long-term plan. I don't know what we call it. But, uh, long-term uh, strategic plans, the initiative, the system-wide strategic plan. So we're going to be taking that month by month and look at it. So if there is no discussion on uh, what we're planning to do, um, from there we're going to start right out. And the first item of business is that I am going to ask the student representatives to introduce themselves. Alexandra, would you start on that end? Uh, yeah, of course. Um, I'm Alexander Euland. I'm from the Duluth campus. I'm a senior majoring in marketing, minoring in, minoring in communication. Um, I'll be graduating this spring, and I'm happy to return this year as my second year as a rep to the board. Great. We're, good. We're glad to have you. And Ms. Karandi? Yes. Okay. Hello. Thank you. Um, Dean Anderson, my name is Jal Karandi. I'm a second year student studying marketing and finance with a minor in business law and leadership. I'm originally from Kenya, but I moved here when I was 18 months old and was raised in Plymouth, Minnesota, and happy to be here today. Thank you. Well, welcome. Welcome. We're glad to have the two of you. Um, with that, uh, we're going to go to, I guess, the, the next, the second item on the agenda, which is the President's recommended 2021 year biennial budget request. This is for review today, and I know President Kaler and some others, including uh, uh, Senior Vice President Burnett are going to be answering or explaining and answering questions. So I don't know, uh, President Kaler, are you going to start the, the show? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I will. And Mr. Chair, members of the board, uh, we bring for your review the university's 2018-19 biennial budget request to the state of Minnesota. Our past partnership with the state has helped build and maintain excellence across the university and prompted new investments in critical research via our innovative MinDrive initiative. Those investments play to the youth's strengths while being central to Minnesota business and the state's innovation culture. Our faculty has responded remarkably well and important interdisciplinary MinDrive research is underway. Throughout this period, we've kept our pledge to reduce administrative costs and covered many cost increases through budget cuts and reallocation. So the request we are proposing today uh, builds on those successes. It strategically focused the university to deliver benefits to Minnesota, its citizens, and to our students and their families. So with that, Mr. Chair, I'll hand things over to the Senior Vice President for Finance and Operation, uh, Brian Burnett, Vice President for University Relations, Matt Kramer, and Assistant Vice President of University Finance, Julie Honison. Thank you. Thank you, President Kaler. Uh, Senior Vice President Burnett, if you would like to go ahead. Thank you, Regent Anderson. <laughs> Members of the Board of Regents, today we bring forth our uh, biennial budget request strategy for your review. Um, the recommended request builds on the priorities that President Kaler just discussed and reflects a strategy that has our university mission and vision as its foundation. It calls on the state to recognize its opportunity to share in the success of this institution and it acknowledges the true cost this institution faces just to remain in place, to maintain quality and preserve the unique experiences it offers our students. We believe the request that we're going to propose to you today for your consideration is fiscally responsible and sensitive to the competing priorities for funding at the state level, and it strives to be simple and straightforward as well as compelling. So the, to, I think Julie's going to, uh, Associate Vice President Thomas is going to walk you through the timeline as we head into a new biennium. Good afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Good. Anderson. To provide some context for the request, we wanted to ground the committee just a little bit in some of the, lo the logistics and the basic information briefly about the appropriation levels and also the request process. The timeline is similar to what has happened in the past. We received instructions from the state of Minnesota this summer 
We began to develop uh, different cost and revenue estimates for our overall budget under different scenarios so that we could understand how potential changes in the appropriation might fit into those scenarios. We then developed the strategy that Brian just outlined. That's led us to the specific recommendations we are bringing before you today. And when this request is finalized in October, we will immediately uh, submit it to the state of Minnesota. This is a, an election year. On a non-election year, we would normally hear from the governor's office on their recommendations sometime in December. This time around, it will be January or February before we hear what that is. The legislative process will begin in February. We will attend those hearings and meetings and so forth until the final appropriation is signed into law, hopefully by the end of May. Uh, whatever the appropriation ends up being uh, for FY20, we will include that amount in the president's recommended operating budget to the board that you will see for review and approval both in June. In terms of the numbers, uh, this is a chart that just shows our current biennium. You can see above the dark blue line, those are the O&M appropriations for this biennium, the operations and maintenance, the large unrestricted block grant to the university. FY18 at 590 million, FY19 at 580 million. Between the two dark blue lines are the five restricted state specials. They are restricted in that the law determines where or which activities within the university have to receive those funds. Those restricted five specials plus the O&M appropriation are all from the state's general fund. The state operates on a, a budget process that is a base plus minus. Uh, so the first step in that is to, to, to determine what our base is. They will look at the FY19 appropriation as our base. This time it is that simple. We have no non-recurring appropriations included in that and there are no automatic increases in law for the next biennium. So it's simply the 19 appropriation and they will make decisions to increase or decrease from that level. Uh, if you want to uh, see the a biennial general fund base, you take the FY19 times two, so it's $1.3 billion. Below the blue, dark blue line, we also get two direct appropriations from the state that are not from the general fund. 2.2 million from the healthcare access fund that goes to the medical school, and 22 million 250,000 from the cigarette tax proceeds that goes to the academic health center, all the units in the, in the academic health center. Uh, those last two non-general fund appropriations have not changed. They have been exactly the same for 13 years. Our total appropriation, including those non-general fund items, has increased and decreased with the state's economy. Our high point in nominal terms was 2008 at 709 million. Since then, we lost almost 140 million on an annual basis by the time we got to 2012, and we have gained about 100 million of that back with our FY19 appropriation at 673 million. That funding level does still remain below the high point of 2008 by 36 million in nominal terms or 144 million adjusting for inflation. That 2008 to 2019 timeframe has seen a continuation of a trend that started well before the Great Recession, and that is a shift in the state appropriation share of our largest unrestricted revenues, state appropriation and tuition. 30 years ago, if you looked at those two sources of revenue for the university, the state appropriation made up 76% of the total, and tuition was 24%. Over time, that proportion has shifted so that today tuition holds the majority share at 58% of the $1.6 billion total and the appropriation has dropped to 42%. But the university has not relied solely on tuition to make up for the drop in state appropriation plus cover general cost increases, which Senior Vice President Burnett will discuss on this next slide. Thank you, uh, Associate Vice President Tonneson. Over the past 30 years, from 1989 to present, we have seen a dramatic and permanent reset of the blend of university revenues, and this chart is very illustrative of that. As the state appropriation has declined as a percent of the total, the university has become more tuition dependent, and even more so on other revenues. And I would point out in the chart that the university had about 50% of its revenues from other than tuition and state support in 1989. Today, that's 60%. And so if you th think about how this university is funded and the various funding sources that come together that put our budget together, there has been a concerted effort over the last 30 years to 
diversify the revenues to not just uh, be reliant on state support and tuition. So that brings us to our recommended proposed request. One item, to provide an increase in our core funding support of $30 million in the first year of the biennium and an additional $27 million in the second year of the biennium. Our goal was to remain simple, straightforward, and honest, and determine an amount that will help us maintain the quality of our program and recognize the financial challenges the state of Minnesota faces. This request represents a modest increase in our general fund biennial base of 6.7%. That's 6.7% calculated on the $1.3 billion base. Since the 96-97 biennium, the university has received an increase in our base nine times out of 12. And across those nine times, the average base increase has been 9.1%, varying from a high of 20.4% back in 98-99 to 3.6% for the current biennium. We believe that this request is responsible in that context, and we hope that it is recognized that way. There is much that the university needs to address in the next two years. Costs related to our basic foundational mission activities will continue to grow. Inflation measured by CPI is running just under 3% today and as measured by the Higher Education Price Index is higher, closer to 4%. Within that, we must provide competitive compensation rates to our talented faculty and staff for which we compete globally in some cases, and with the best the Twin Cities and the region has to offer in others. This is a high priority for the university. We also must comply with federal and state regulations in many aspects, aspects of our work, and with the expectations of the board of regents, the legislature, and the constituents, which requires continued vigilance, upgrades, improvements, and expertise. The nuts and bolts of this place do need attention, whether it's replacing outdated classroom technology or fixing leaky roofs, the work and the costs related to those things never go down. And finally, we have existing programs throughout the state that also need attention, whether it's instructional areas with high demand, such as computer science and engineering, that simply don't have adequate space or personnel capacity to meet their potential, or perhaps the Organizations like the Vet Diagnostic Lab and Minnesota Extension, both gems of the university and the state that have had to face flat revenues for quite some time. Or perhaps it's a research area that needs basic infrastructure to remain competitive for external grants. There are many needs out there that need to be prioritized and supported. And we are proposing that the state provide this funding requested in this proposal to allow the president and you, the Board of Regents, to make those strategic decisions. It is too early in the budget process for a great deal of specificity in cost estimates, but we do feel confident in some very high level estimates for the next biennium. Holding compensation close to but just under inflation while addressing the increasing competitive needs and healthcare benefit costs remains our largest expected cost increase and our highest priority. As the chart shows, we are projecting potential cost increases here of $40 million in each of the next two years, and that's just in the state and tuition funded portion of the budget. Beyond that, you see the typical cost categories we face each year with estimated increases based on trend or in some cases based on some actual cost information. The unit specific needs and invested in this chart at $15 million per year is a goal amount that doesn't begin to address all the priority needs I was just talking about, but would allow us to fund many of the things that rise to the very top. And our early planning on how to address those costs involves the requested state appropriation increase, with the, but with the majority of the need, 57% of it coming from continued internal budget cuts or reallocation potential limited growth in some of our other revenue sources where possible, and potentially thoughtful and strategic increases in tuition rates and or targeted growth in enrollment. The numbers you see here will change as planning proceeds, but we feel they are reasonable estimates at this point in the planning process. And with that, I'll turn it over to our Vice President for University Relations, Matt Kramer, to close out the presentation with some thoughts on the strategy and the benefits of this request. Thank you, Vice President Kramer. Uh, Mr. Chair, Associate Vice President Tonneson, thank you. Uh, 
Ms. Tonneson has captured the budget aspect of this. What I want to do is very quickly summarize the legislative strategy on this. While the request is modest, it is focused on the core mission. It is significantly higher than last year's. And it also emphasizes with the legislature that the authority as to how the money is directed rests with this board. That doesn't mean that we wouldn't accept state specials, but the challenge with state specials, as this board is well aware, is by teeing up specific initiatives, we invite initiatives to be invested in that may not be strategic to the institution. And we wanted to offer to the legislature a budget strategy that deals with the autonomy of this board focused on the core mission. Mr. Chair, thank you. Thank you. So that's, that's it, huh? That was, that was brief and concise. I like that. <laughs> so what that does, and we try to do that, is to give or a regents, uh, a lot of time to discuss it. Maybe there would be a little bit. Do we have anybody that wants to comment? Regent Spigum. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. Kramer, Vice President Kramer, <clears throat> I thought I heard you say that the uh, request is higher than last year's. Uh, I'm sorry, the, the request at 6.7% is greater than the, the award that was given last year, which was three point I by mistake. The request is something like 142 yeah. or 140. Yes, no, I'm, uh, Mr. Chair, Regents Figum, absolutely. <clears throat> I misspoke. The amount we're requesting this year is greater than that was awarded last year. And Mr. Chairman, if I could, as you look to develop this, Matt and Julie, um, a kind and humble suggestion. I don't know if you want to take this into account or not, but I don't want to talk about the dollar amount, the 85 million. If you think that's what we need, I'm all for it. If you think that's the dollar, I don't know that number. But I might suggest to you humbly that uh, we ask for a larger amount in the first year of the biennial mm -hmm. and much less in the second year. Um, as you know, the second year of the biennium is supposed to be a non-funding year. Generally, Senator Johnson, the legislature only uh, doesn't get into great funding increases in the second year. They try to take care of emergencies. And I know for a fact we look closer more at the, the tails and the structural balance from the state standpoint in the upcoming year. So a kind suggestion would be if it's 85 you need, maybe front load it to the first year to avoid the uh, the more scrutiny on the tails and the year where we're not supposed to be funding other than emergencies. Great. Uh, uh, Regent Spigum, I, from my point of view, that's probably a good strategy. You, you, what you're suggesting is maybe ask for 55 million the first year and 30 million the second. The only, the only part of that is, and, and I need to know your assumption on this, is that we're getting less the second year. Actually, Mr. Chairman, my suggestion would be to ask for uh, $40 million the first year because you, you, we want it in recurring funds, correct? Correct, correct. It would be more like 40 the first year, then that would be the automatic 40 the second year, and then ask for the, the five extra or whatever. But I, I think it should be further. Just a kind suggestion. I understand that. Do you, do you have comments on that panel? And Re Regent Anderson, um, Regent Spigen, we can certainly consider that. We did front load it to a bit when we had 30 million in the first year and 27 in the second. But to, in biennial math, that'll be 2x of the first year. And we were working hard to keep a two year increase below 7%. Because again, we think it's attainable. We think it's strategic. And we and so that's why we would we can certainly look at, at modeling that and bringing that to the board in October, um, but if we did a number like forty, then you, if we want to stay with this number, then we would ask for seven incremental in the second year because it'd be eighty in biennial math. As I if I have my biennial math correct. So, Mr. Chairman, Bruce just, just look at it from the legislative perspective. The second year of the biennium is not a funding year. It's it, and, and we felt that very clearly last year, Mr. Chairman, thank you, Regent Sviggum, when we had that $10 million tail that was evidenced on the slide. So we, we totally understand the second year of a biennium can be a challenging piece for us. So we'll, I think that's a very, very good suggestion that we'll think about. And I want to get um, Associate Vice President Tonneson's. Associate Vice President Tonneson wants to say something. Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Regent Sviggum, I just did want to make clear, too, that uh, the way that we have crafted this and with the dollars, we would not assume that we would come in in the second year with a supplemental request. So I just want to make that clear because that is also something they you know, try to avoid so that we have the biennial funding year to fund the next two years. And then the year in between, 
sometimes they allow for a supplemental budget request that might be small. They don't like to do that. And this does not assume we would do that. So this is going in right now, asking for the biennial increase, and then that would be it for the biennium unless circumstances change. Well, Mr. Chairman, then, Julie, I may have misunderstood. I thought the 27 was your supplemental budget request for the second year. Um, that shows you Vice President Tonneson. Mr. Chair, Regent Spinkham, it is, but it's asking for it right now, not waiting for a year during the supplemental mm -hmm. process. I just want to make that clear because that's... Good luck could, to make that could be, the legislation. Yeah, I'm just... So, so from my point of view, yeah. the, the good point is we're not arguing about the money. We're arguing about the strategy. Yeah. And yeah. Regent Sviggum and Regent Johnson, with your, your years in the legislature, I think you guys are, are great resources for these people to talk to. And I think as we move on, let's, let's keep that discussion going. Regent Shu. Thank you, Chair Anderson. Thank you, presenters. Um, did I miss somewhere what the, uh, any projections on tuition on this, in this presentation? Uh, Associate Vice President Tonneson. Mr. Chair, Regent Chu, there are no specific projections on tuition. What we have suggested in this slide is that through the budget process, we will have to decide how to develop that 57% of the solution between reallocation, tuition from different sources, and perhaps some other revenues. Regent Chu. Uh, yeah, so if we applied kind of what happened last year, how would, how would these three areas break out? Does the panel have an answer? What happened last year? Can, we, can you uh, elaborate, Regent Chu? I mean, I think on what happened last year, you mean like, well, like you raising the out-of-state tuition first and... Well, yeah, and I'm not sure what our procedure is going to be on out-of-state versus, you know... Instant, yep. But I think last year, I didn't like the way it happened where we did one and then waited six months and did the other one, which you know meant that there was nothing we could do about the first one at right. that point. But so let's say the, I don't know if you can do this math in your head. Probably not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but if we had a 15 minute, you, you can, I guess we have to approve this today, don't we? So. Um, oh, it's no, it's review today. It's review today, Regent Shu. So we got all, all sorts of time. I'll, I'll come back to you later. But uh, so if we could get the answer for um, that question, you know, if it was a 15% uh, out of state and then, I don't know, two, what was it, two and a half? Okay. Uh, senior Vice President Burnett, scenario. Do, do you have an answer to that question? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Regent Chu, in the work plan for next month's meeting, in addition to bringing this forward for action, is going to be a comprehensive review of the NRNR and what the results have been from the years of double-digit tuition increases, both um, revenue gained, enrollment change, all of that. So I think um, that is in the work plan to, to have that information before further decisions are made. That's why we're not pinning that here at this point. Um, but we'll work to bring some potential scenarios. There's a number of ways you could get to the 37 million in fiscal year 20 between cuts and tuition and that type of thing. But I think at this level, what we were what we were trying to show is just at our very first thinking about how the state support that we're suggesting you consider at this level would affect the next two years operating budgets. Okay, I'll just Re 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 shoot. I'll just reiterate that it's my belief that. Um, when we when we actually make the request, we should have an idea of what the tuition change is going to be, and that's going to help us socialize the um, the strategy at the legislature. Got it. Any further questions, Regent Shu? Regent Rocha. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm kind of coming out of the the Regent Sviggum uh, conversation. I got a couple things here that. that I, I wasn't real clear sort of where we landed in that conversation. So, Regent Sviggum, if you would, you know, yield um, to a question. So, to understand, no. <laughs> Regent Omari, if you would speak on behalf of Regent Sviggum, I'd like to ask you a question. So, so you, you, I, I mean, essentially you're saying from the legislative analysis, if you need, if you need 87, you ask for an increase of, of 43 and a half in both years. Because if you if you if you grow it in the second year, that that is conceived. You know, the, the, the issue is there's the tail, uh, and, you know, and then the additional the increase on top of the tail and the recurring money 
is what gets us into trouble, or is that overstated? Regent Sviggum, do you have an answer? Mr. Chairman, let, let me try to clarify. Maybe it wasn't very clear. Uh, Regent Rocha, all, all the monies will be tails one way or another, whether you do it in the first year or the second year. It, you, you have to address it in your structural balance of the state. So it will, will create tails, whether it be either year. Um, my suggestion is just a kind one that says that uh, the legislature usually Senator Johnson doesn't look favorable upon budget requests in the second year of the, of the biennium. Unless something happens in an emergency situation, a special uh, uh, appropriation is needed for something. Generally, the first year is the budget year. Can you take care of the budget there? Oh, okay. Uh, so my suggestion would be that we make sure that we get, if we need 87 million, and I'm not there yet, I'm not there to say we need 87 million. If this be proposed at 87 million, we make sure it be all there funded in the first year of the biennium or the greatest share so we don't come in with a supplemental appropriation. Mr. Chair, just to clarify. Uh, go ahead, Regent Roshan. To clarify, so, you, so and, and I think maybe this is where uh, Vice President uh, Tonneson was talking about. Um, you're not talking about a supplemental request, which is a sep You're saying that when we make the biennial request, we request it. It doesn't matter necessarily that year one is A and year two is A plus um, inflation. That's okay. It's just it's we're not looking at it as a supp it's a supplemental request because it's a biennial. Okay, I, I think that's where I that's where I was confused that you were mm -hmm. you were talking about how you ask for the biennial number. You're saying don't expect a supplemental. That would be okay. my direction, Regent Rocha, is that we don't come in for supplement. And my understand, my look at this was that $27 million was going to be a supplemental request for this. Okay. Year. All right. And, and I don't believe that's how it's parsed. Is that no, correct? No, it's, it's, no, so maybe, do you want to answer that, Associate Vice President Tonneson? Sure, Anderson, perhaps this is just semantics, but uh, this doesn't assume a supplemental request okay. the second year. However, this request we're submitting would have an incremental increase the second year of the biennium. So, just to be clear, it, it, Correct. But it's, they, they would approve that in the budget year approve, of the first year the and say next year. year you're getting this much more. Yes, sir. That's yes, sir. historically what we've done. Yes, sir. Okay. Regent uh, Rocha still. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, so moving, moving along from there. Um, the, the slide that showed the tuition versus state appropriations, I just I want to just point out that you know, where it shows tuition as a as a growing percentage in state appropriation, when you're dealing with percentages, it can overstate because obviously the university over the same period of time has made decisions about expenditures uh, in certain areas that some might argue are not always essential to the educational process or the research process, outreach process. So because it's percentages, it's the growth of the overall that, that can have this sort of skewing. So this, this impugns the state as though somehow they've walked away. And, and clearly there have been real decreases, but this overstates what those decreases are because the overall cost is, is above that. Um, but I, I, I kind of want to go back to tying together Regent Spiggum's comments and, and, and Regent Shue's comments in that, um, and, and this comes off a little bit of Vice President Kramer's uh, statement about this board decides how expenditures are made. Fair enough. You know, I mean, we all agree with that, but let's face it. You know, we're going to the legislature saying among all of the incredible requests and needs that you face, you know, we want the money. And I, I, I don't, I, I would not go over and say, just give us the money and we'll decide where it goes. And I understand that's not what you're saying, but you know, I, I'm a, I'm, I'm a, I, I part a little bit with my colleague, Regent Sviggum, in that I don't have a problem asking for a substantial amount from the legislature and then let them in there substantial expertise and representation um, role of, of, of as the, the people's representatives decide whether or not the money is well spent here. But to make the case, we need to give them clarity on how it's going to be spent. And we need to make sure that they understand that we treat every dollar as our own and that we are you know, fiercely defensive of how that is spent. So as I, I can, you know, you can get me there on the, on the total ask, but my great concern is we just still are not giving enough clarity to the legislature to say, and if you make the investment here versus helping you know, all the other needs, whether it's K, you know, or E12, whether it's uh, um, you know, health healthcare needs or otherwise, th this is why this is a good investment. And so that's, I just want to throw that plug in there that the more clarity that we can give them and the more assurance that they know that the money is going to be spent well, the more likely we are going to get those investments. And this goes back to Regent Shue's position. You know, I'm, I'm convinced that last year, w one of the big challenges we faced is that the legislature, I think, would have absolutely embraced an investment in the university if they knew that resident tuition was going to be 
um, a, a major focus, if not the focus, of that additional funding. Um, we, I don't think we were able to give them that clarity, and I think that that's why a lot of folks walked away from it. So as we go into this process, and you know, this is right down your alley, uh, Vice President Kramer, I think that getting, getting a clear direction from this board of where those priorities are as we work through strategic planning and other things going on, we are going to be far more likely to, to have success based on the feedback that I'm, I'm getting from our colleagues down on University <coughs> Avenue. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Rocha. And on the part of clarity, I, I, that is what I hear from the legislature, too. We just need to be clear where we're going to spend the money that we're asking them to appropriate. So I, I agree with Regent Rocha on that. And sometimes they've complained that we haven't done that well. I mean, so uh, Regent Simonson. Uh, just kind of an, this is an over-the-top uh, review, I think. Uh, on the all other revenues, we will see more of a breakdown on that coming forward. Uh, panel? Mr. Chair, Regent Simonson, as part of the budget conversation, yes, we will. We can talk about the other revenues even starting next month in October. But each time we come back, and uh, we will provide information on that. And there is also a quite a bit of breakdown in the budget itself in the budget okay. document. Yeah, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, Regent Beeson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, you know, we're not going to have a new governor in place until January, so that's after. Um, by when we submit this budget, and I think we should view it is important to have clarity, but it's also important to recognize that it is a placeholder amount, and it's not that different from what state agencies produce uh, uh, for the governor. And the governor, the new governor, won't be in place, and the new governor will be looking at, you know, will be beginning that process sort of parallel with the with the legislature's deliberations of the budget. Also, I want to make a comment on NRNR. I know we're going to talk about this next month. Uh, the key point, and obviously it's not, it's, it's, it's different to approve one part of our tuition strategy and then defer on the other until spring. But from what I've heard from staff, having that, that six months uh, in advance really helps the people that have to sell that product to those students. So that provided clarity last year for, for uh, people who we've hired to uh, bring in non-resident, non-reciprocity uh, students. So I like that. I know it does, it sort of boxes out part of the tuition revenue, but if, if the staff can demonstrate that it's, that it's helpful uh, in providing clarity to those students, I think we should stay with the strategy that we started last year. We're all curious about what that the data has to tell the story around how our strategy is working. We're all interested in whether that's sustainable, that 15 percent, uh, and uh, and if so, you know, at what cost and what those waivers are, and et cetera. Thank you. I appreciate hearing that, uh, Regent Beeson. You want to answer that, Senior Vice President Burnett? Thank you, Mr. Chair and Regent Beeson. You know, I think. The other piece that I interpret um, was that there was a policy direction for this board. Rather, there, there is a budget impact to it, for sure. But, but, but what I interpret, that there was a policy direction when our resident tuition was at the middle of the Big Ten and our non-resident, non-reciprocity was down near the bottom. And so I think that it's more of a policy goal that has budget implications, fair. So I think giving our staff the tools to be able to do its best to um, make sure we don't lose enrollment and lose money in this pricing, what I would say a structural pricing adjustment, is why we brought that to you last year. And so we'll we'll have a pretty robust conversation. In fact, we're going to be Associate Vice President Tonneson and Vice Provost um, Bob McMaster will be doing that together to talk about both the financial implications and the recruitment implications and the class implications and looking back at several years worth of data. So um, we'll be bringing that to you in, um, next month. I, I appreciate those comments. I appreciate, you know, Regent Beeson bringing up what he brings up, Regent Rocha what he brings up, Regent Shu what he brings up. One of the great things is, you know, we've got 12 diverse opinions here. None of us are necessarily right or wrong, but we get to bring those up and we'll see where that data brought us. I think it's good to bring it up. Uh, Regent McMillan, did you want to speak? Thank you, Chair Anderson. Um, question that probably goes to the whether 87 is the right number or not, but it's not a specific question. I'm looking at the the timeline here and going back to the July to September timeframe and wondering as you, as you pivot from a 
an approach with the legislature where there was a, you know, one major ask for the general budget and then a bunch of smaller ones. I get where you're going to this one simple ask and, and I appreciate that, but I'm curious to what degree in that short period of time between whatever, you know, middle of July till now, has the, has the, have the component parts of the university that would have normally had a special here, a special there, a direct ask, a min, uh, men drive ask, whatever, I've, is everything built into that? Have they had time to be heard? And I'm not, you know, suggesting anything that, uh, you know, somebody got skipped in this. I'm just curious. It feels from my, my level, like it might have, you know, has that happened? Has everybody had a chance to weigh in or are we going to end up with some supplemental asks anyway as you go out and ask the rest of the system and the various colleges and uh, across the research, education and outreach space? I hope it's all built in, but if that didn't occur in that time frame, we could end up with some supplementals any or some additional asks anyway. That's a great question, Regent McMillan, because we don't want to get caught doing too little. Uh, Vice President Kramer, do you seem to have an answer? Uh, Mr. Chair, um, uh, Regent McMillan, the answer is yes. Um, people have had the opportunity to provide their number. It has been baked in. I think I would also share that I suspect most people are not happy. Because if you totaled up the ask of every single unit in the university, it would be significantly more than 87 million. And judgments had to be made as to where we would place priorities. But yes, they have been consulted. Thank you. Follow up, Regent McMillan. Very quickly, thank you, Vice President Kramer. And I have no doubt that that disappointment's out there. I just want to be sure voices were heard and people had a chance to get their ask in. So. Thank you. Regent Sviggum, do you want to bring us home on this topic? I will bring you home, Mr. Chairman. I just, just a very quick unscientific poll, uh, totally unscientific, but to the question of NRNR, the, um, the night of move-in here where Regent Lucas and Regent Amari and I uh, moved in some freshmen, four out of the first five freshmen we moved in were NRNR, uh, Maryland, Michigan, Illinois, um, and they were so very happy about being here at the University of Minnesota. <clears throat> I did ask one of them if the NRNR increase had any effect at all, and she said no, it had not. Now, her parents were not standing there to <laughs> respond, but uh, it was very interesting. They were all so positive, so so happy to be here at the university, and, and Mr. Burnett was there sweating. We were just talking. Uh, well, from, from, from my unscientific post, if uh, Regent Omari and Regent Lucas and Regent Sviggum were there, I'm guessing that Regent Omari and Regent, Lu Regent Lucas were working and Regent Sviggum was the supervisor. <laughs> okay. Regent, um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Regent Sviggum, the other thing that was compelling to me when we moved in the young woman from New Jersey and she told us her major was chemical engineering. And I asked her, why did, she pick, why did she pick the University of Minnesota coming from the middle of New Jersey? And she said she did the research to where the best place for chemical engineering was in the United States and decided to come here. So I thought it was also telling to me that quality, other, the, we have to maintain our quality. And, and this goes back really to the heart of this biennial budget request is our most valuable resource I would submit to the board is our people. And we need to invest in our people. And um, yes, we have facilities challenges. Yes, we have real estate needs and that type of thing. But at the end of the day, if we don't have that talented faculty member in the front of the classroom, we don't attract that student from New Jersey to come here and supplement all the num thousands of Minnesota students that we educate here. So I, we were in that room and I thought it was just an amazing response to a simple question. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, Ms. Donison, Mr. Kramer. Thank you for your time. Thank you for leading us through this. Uh, and it's just for review today. So I am going to make a little change. We're going to jump to item number four, the St. Paul Strategic Facilities Plan and discussion. Um, I hope that uh, Dean Burr and uh, Vice President Bertelson are here. Uh, I do see that uh, uh, Dean Tolar is actually in the room, but we're going to keep you going next. And you've not only proved to me today that you can uh, run a good medical school, but you are like in a time warp. You're here before you ever thought you would be here. So, but we're still going to go ahead as planned with uh, moving this group forward. So they're going to bring us to a, just a discussion of a strategic plan in St. Paul. Again, no action is going to be needed on this today. Um, Vice President Bertelson, when you're ready, we're ready for you. 
Thank you much. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you much, Mr. Chair and Regents. Uh, today we are thankful to and appreciate the opportunity to update you on the progress of the St. Paul Strategic Facility Plan. Uh, Dean Burr and I are glad to present the preliminary recommendations from this 12-month effort that's been developed with the seven deans who have space on the campus, student affairs, um, and a cross-section of units that uh, participate on the St. Paul campus today. Um, today's discussion, we're gonna talk about how we built the plan, the vision and mission of the plan, some key recommendations and next steps for how we are proceeding with this, where we'll take this information next. Today, the St. Paul campus is about 4.2 million square feet. To put that in context, the Duluth campus is approximately 3.2 million square feet. There are 2,600 staff and faculty. There's over 100,000 visitors a year to multiple destinations. Uh, and approximately 20% of the Twin Cities undergraduate population takes at least one class per semester on the St. Paul campus. Uh, St. Paul is a destination for the state, be it the Vet Med Hospital, lifelong learning from the belt, the continuing ed, but it's also a programmatic home for an enormous amount of outreach and extension where we take university research and you can see sites across the state really in nearly every county and every location. The campus itself is a living lab, uh, being the fields, forests, wetlands, and lawns where the land is part of the research. Um, the land is not a space just to build buildings. The land is the program, is our research. Um, from an academic planning perspective, uh, checking in with all the colleges, there will be targeted growth in enrollment in a select colleges, but not an overwhelming or um, um, multiples kind of a growth. So it's a place where we think the existing size and capacity of the infrastructure is sufficient to support that growth, but we have to, we'll be talking today about the kinds of investments to impact the location and quality of the kind of facilities that support it. Why do we do this plan? There are really two primary goals here. One is to make sure we have the right ideas and direction to spur the experiential impact of the St. Paul campus, both for students, our community, and all those who come to our campus. And second is to resolve a certain degree of uncertainty um, about what the future of the campus is and what we will make it up so that we have a consolidated vision, cohesive vision, that we can sell both to donors, to students, to business partners, and to the legislature. Hey, Mr. Burleson and Regents, Mr. Chair, thank you for inviting me here today to discuss this. We're certainly excited about it. And I think uh, Vice President Burleson talked about one of the key aspects of this. We had eight deans and two uh, offices from student services and including library systems um, talking about what might we do to envision the future of the St. Paul campus. So it really was a comprehensive vision. As part of that, um, there was also a significant amount of consultation with the faculty, students, and staff around the campus. So this is a time where I was really impressed with this, this eclectic group kind of demonstrating the depth of interdisciplinary work and engagement that happens on the campus came together to work across this vision. So it really does, I'm here simply representing that broader group of people. Um, as Vice President Burleson said, the key part of that campus is it is an urban campus that supports the land grant mission. Not only that, contrary to my friends in surrounding states, we're the only campus where a student can come to a College of Food, Agriculture, Natural Resource Sciences, Veterinary Medicine, College of Biological Sciences, and walk from their dorm room to a field, to a livestock facility, and engage in the activities occurring in those facilities. Um, other places don't have that opportunity as we do, which is often a misconception we have. And that idea of we've really infused our work within the student experience and the research we do is key to that. And just an example that we talked about that catalyzed this, I think, from the start is, we of course have a, a student nutrition program in dietetics. So students research how they can improve nutrition through working with, with uh, counseling with individuals. And of course, we have food service on campuses, for example. And so the idea of bringing students in dietetics to engage with people who are in those food service systems to do internships and work in that is that idea of actually taking the, the infusing their experience and work within the actual activities of the campus. And we really do that more broadly when we talk about agriculture and, and food systems, for example. Another key part of that connection is engaging students, academics, the public sector, including government, as well as industry. And we have several partnerships now across campus we could talk about from USDA, uh, biosecure labs, vet diagnostic labs, um, and including uh, several companies that are actually affiliated with the campus there. And what it represents overall is we often talk about interdisciplinary collaboration. The St. Paul campus is a place where there is really an ecology of innovation. We cut across biological sciences, physical sciences, health sciences, 
Um, we include uh, oftentimes uh, economics and, and bio, bioengineering. And so we truly do and have for 150 years represented that ideal of bringing together the sciences to solve some of the grand challenges. And that really is the vision expressed in this to carry that into the next uh, century as we, we look to 150 years of that. Um, thank you. Um, the system-wide strategic plan, of course, is critical. And again, um, I think as Vice President Burleson said, this does cut across all campuses in all the state of Minnesota. Um, I, hesitate to, I hesitate to call it a hub for those activities, but often tight because it's bi-directional. We're not simply going out to the state, we're actually engaging and that's coming back into what we do. So it really is this, this connection between that. And in, that, in the system-wide strategic plan, there's a conversation about distinctiveness. And again, it is that distinctiveness of the work we're doing actually being expressed in the campus, facilities, fields, forests, lawns itself is very different. The opportunity to bring the broader Minnesota community into that conversation as an outreach component that I'll talk about in a little bit. In addition, we do, of course, extension is connected across the entire state in all the counties, several regional offices. Our research and outreach centers in CFANS, are, are, there's 10 outreach and, uh, research and outreach centers across the state. Three of those are co-located with system campuses, one at Crookston, one at Morris, one at Duluth. And so we naturally have and have actually academic and research programs that cut across those areas. So again, we're engaged heavily within the system strategic plan and, and delivering that, that value to all constituents. Um, in several places we do have, I need to mention uh, CBS, that in that regard there's the Itasca uh, uh, Research Center that's in Northwest Minnesota, working on ecosystems related to forests and waters and so on. And there's also Cedar Creek, which is just north of the cities here, working the ecology of, of, and healthy systems that are really critical. So we do touch a lot of the state again, and a lot of citizen science happens there when you think about invasive species and identification of whether it's crop diseases or pests or so on, invasive species in lakes and rivers, we're engaged in that activity. It's just this campus represents so much of that mission to be engaged in the teaching and science. Um, you know, short roll, thank you. So one of the pieces of this plan that we think is really, really critical and vital, and there's a lot of conversation I'm sure to be had about this over time, but this, this, field, this idea of fields, forests, lawns, wetlands, water, really central issues to Minnesota. Regardless of where you go in Minnesota, those are key to people's lives in Minnesota. It's why we value the state the way we do. And we're fortunate that that campus actually represents, in a way, a little bit of the biomes of Minnesota in the way it's laid out. So we do have wetlands there. We do have the forests arcing through campus of northern Minnesota. We, of course, have the fields that are demonstrated here. And that was seen in this plan as a central piece of the identity and engagement in this campus. And so we're delighted to see that as a, as a key component. Um, I will point out that it is the it is the only university, again in the in the in the country that has that urban connection as well. Many times I was talking to the corn growers recently, for example, and they were visiting the Bell Museum. And of course, they looked out. If you've looked out the east window of the Bell Museum, you look over our research fields, and of course, that notion of bringing in the community to this idea of what's happening on those fields. What are we doing to improve food availability? We have an organic uh, student farm that's operating there that works to you know. Uh, educate students in organic and sustainable food systems. The Good Acre Food Hub is just, you can just see it across there, which is a food hub bringing food into the Twin Cities community to distribute to places where people may not have access to fresh produce. We actually work with them now to develop greenhouse systems and nutrition systems to educate the communities in the Twin Cities about food and the role of nutrition and health. So again, those fields, which people often drive by when they're going to the State Fair and wonder what in the world this blank slate is doing there, has a, has a huge amount of innovation, research, and education component that's happening on those fields throughout the year and a very unique resource to connect with consumers who are so interested in what's happening in agriculture, food systems, natural resources today. So it's just a tremendous opportunity, we think, in this strategic plan. And I, in, in the slide um, on the outreach destinations, I just want, I'll actually reflect a little bit. One of our great uh, gems of, the, of our system is the Arboretum, which most of you have probably traveled to. And I, I want you to think of that context if you've walked around the three mile walk at the Arboretum before, um, through the various aspects of, of course, there's trees, woody plants, floral demonstrations, and so on. But the St. Paul campus, we haven't typically thought of it that way, but it really is a place where people can, people can come and have an experience to connect to natural resources, agriculture, food and water and, and the health sciences through vet, vet, veterinary medicine. So as, as you look at this map, if you go from the Bell Museum, now as a gateway, and I'm, I'm very pleased to say we already have 50,000 visitors from that from July 13th. It's been a spectacular success. Um, we're looking forward to that being an integral part of connecting people to the university. And I'll point out it also connects into 10 planetariums across the state, again, connecting to all state people to bring programming in and out through the Bell Museum. As you move south, 
from the Bell Museum across the campus, it actually follows this notion that natural resources is central and core to everything that we base agriculture, food systems, water resources on. On the north end of campus is our forestry department, it's our fishes, wildlife, conservation, biology, it's our water resource sciences and soil sciences. Those mat natural resources upon which everything fits. And so in this planning, there's sort of a, so a north to south movement. And as you move down the hill from that end of it, you start to move to plants, the place where life connects to our natural resources, of course. And from plants, you move slightly down the hill. College of Biological Sciences is there working on plants, genomics, uh, eco ecology, to bring more of that richness of how do eco ecosystems work on it. You move further along and you end up in animals, veterinary medicine, animal science. You're moving right through the life, chi life chain of, of natural resources and agriculture. Move one step further and you end up at food science and nutrition, connecting to the human health and nutrition aspects of the campus. So the campus for 150 years has been laid out this way, but what this vision does is really brings that into a place where the research, the teaching, the outreach, bringing people into this conversation that we need to resolve over the next 10 to 20 years on natural resources, food and agriculture, it really enlivens the ability to do that um, and bring that into the 21st century. Ambrosen. Um, so I'm gonna talk more about some of the concepts that have been emerged as themes and ideas in the planning effort that we've done. And I wanna emphasize whenever the danger of putting up a map or a picture creates a sense that it's a, a fait accompli, that this is a completed outcome um, and that's not the case, but it makes it difficult to talk about, with putting out without putting some images in front of you. So I want to emphasize as we go through these next several slides that these are ideas that have emerged. These are ideas that we're putting forward for your consideration and, and discussion. Um, and then we will also then, following th this over the next couple of months, be taking these same ideas for consultation and further refinement to the St. Paul campus uh, community as well. So I'll emphasize that maybe one more time at the end. So in the, the five big themes we have are five different chain zones um, or areas where we have um, that, that exemplify the kind of ideas that came from the planning. The first is the Buford um, Civic Spine. And so as we look toward um, from Cleveland east toward the, um, east toward the State Fair, um, Buford is really the central entrance to the campus from the west. It's sort of the downtown main street of the, of the campus. So I'm gonna use the analogy of a small town. Imagine as we think about any kind of small town, if you took the activities that draw people to a place, if you scattered them across the, the corners of that town, you would have no vibrancy or no activity. And one of the senses that I think really came forward, we heard in the thousands of replies of surveys we heard from the community is it felt like the campus lacks a certain energy and um, continuity and the pulls the campus community together and brings uh, that energy and engagement. So one of the themes here is how do we make Buford that civic spine? How do we consolidate and bring together the, the kinds of spaces where people interact and cross? And the idea here is to cons for us to consider and do further planning for moving the St. Paul Student Union, which is um, at its nearing the end of its useful life to be engaged and part of, in, uh, built in and connected to the current library, what we label here as a student commons. So that in that space from Rutan, the major classroom building, to the library, to the student union, connected right to the parking behind it, and just um, almost to the, connect, the convention center, that the major areas uh, of engagement would all be connected along a, the main thoroughfare or the main um, road of the Buford um, Road, where we consider looking at uh, reinvesting in the spine as a street for transit, pedestrians, and frankly, fewer vehicles, and reinvesting in that set of buildings where it draws people in, be it classrooms, library, parking, uh, conference center. And we look for efficiencies in the services that we provide. So instead of right today, we have three separate kitchens, none of which really makes anybody happy. Is there a way that we can start thinking about consolidating that to provide better, better support services? And, uh, now again, just these are not designs, but just images as examples to show the kind of ideas that we imagine in that student commons, the places where you would be, um, the students can study, eat, find their student services, um, study, and uh, connect and collaborate with faculty and other students and other staff. That this density is the kind of activity 
creates a new vibrancy for, presents the opportunity for a new vibrancy for the campus. Another place we imagine connecting is not so much within the campus, but bringing the, connecting the campus to the community. We have a beautiful and historic lawn, but we've tar started to talk about ideas like an outreach pavilion, where it could be an outdoor place for a farm to table uh, meal with the community and the campus, or a farmer's market, where we bring and connect the kind of programs and thing, uh, activities of the campus to the community, inviting the community into campus and being uh, connected. The next theory is up on the circle, the Buford Circle. What do we know is that the St. Paul campus has been underinvested in for capital renewal, which means that we have significant re capital renewal needs. This, we intend to try to uh, address that through a series of moves. One, renewing existing research spaces through selective demolition and replacement, the most expensive this, the kinds of spaces that we could, where we can have the most opportunity for shared space. Also to maintain, but to maintain the supply of research space across the collegiate research activities, we, that we would then proceed to demolish buildings not worthy of further investment, and then with what's left, targeted renovations for remaining facilities for education and um, administrative work. So this is examples of places that you could do that. Um, again, that the themes are targeted new research facilities supplemented by demolition and renovations with the idea that collectively at the end, we have enough space. It's about finding the right kind of space and quality in the right locations. Next is to the Northeast Quadrant Partnership Development. So this is sort of looking from the south to the north um, over the convention center, which is the building on the southeast part of the building. So this set is, this idea is that we have an opportunity for growth to bring in industry, government, and university partnerships for those who are interested and have connections to programs that are on the St. Paul campus. So we'll be talking about later about how we also are trying to do that on the Minneapolis campus. We think there are unique partnerships and opportunities with industry and government and other nonprofits who want to be near our research, pro research programs and to be able to share the kind of um, research infrastructure that neither of us maybe can afford all by ourselves. Next to the vet, med, veterinary medicine and hospital zone, um, we are the site of one of the nation's busiest and largest veterinary teaching hospitals, more than 35,000 companion and 4,000 large animal cases a year. That diagnostic lab itself is, performs over 1.3 million tests in 2017, and there are many other examples of the size and complexity of the significant um, program and business. The value of education, research, and clinical veterinary care to the animal related activity in the state of Minnesota is of course essential to our state and to that significant industry across the state. This plan would propose targeted replacements with a new front door for the hospital, selected renovations to upgrade remaining facilities. This picture talks again looks starts from Como Avenue toward the north to what is currently the Commonwealth Terrace Co-op Housing. This housing is owned by the university but managed by the students who live there as a co-op. The focus here is on family housing, especially for graduate and professional students. And though usually housing, the mantra is location, location, location. For this set of students there, surveys tell us it's about price, price, price. And with this kind of, um, and you're not making much money here in, uh, when you're a grad student, a professional student, especially if you have a family. And so this is a very unique set of housing, but it's also incredibly old. We maintained it from a safe condition, but the quality of it is not for the long term. And we need to think about how can we continue to provide that opportunity and support for those students, but in an affordable way. We also know that there's activities of retail and living that we can't, in our community and size of the campus itself, support. But we see a growing development from the west toward the east along Como, we think there's opportunity for us to evaluate bringing other services, retail and residential activities to campus to be part and extension of the campus, but leveraging the community investments with us. So we know that those are concepts that need to be tested. These are only, again, images of that idea, not a plan, <laughs> things that we would have to be tested over time. So that's really the five major sort of themes. We know from a stakeholder perspective, we have this is the beginning of that consultation work. You're at the beginning of that when we are leaving plenty of time to hear your input and ideas that we will 
take into consideration as we continue this work. Um, and then we'll be working through each of the colleges and public hearings for the community and those on the campus over the next couple months. The takeaways are this, and um, these words I think are just the right ones. The St. Paul campus optimizes its land grant mission in an urban setting, as the dean outlined, organized around place specific subject areas of food, agriculture, environment, and education. This is really the vision and mission of the campus. What do we want? How do we want for outcomes of this work when we would finish the kind of work we're talking about is to increase the vibrancy of the student and campus experience. We want to be a welcoming destination for lifelong learners, whether you're coming to see the Raptor Center or the Bell to continuing ed for throughout your life, renewing connections across the state through outreach and extension, and targeted locations for unique research and industry partnerships. And with that, um, we are happy to take your comments and uh, questions. Thank you, Vice President Bertelson. Dean Brewer, that uh, looks like exciting <coughs> times coming in St. Paul. Um, good. So I'm going to start it off. Uh, Regent Beeson had raised his hand, and our Regent from St. Paul will start off the St. Paul discussion. Thank you for acknowledging that fact, actually. And I, you know, I've had the benefit of working on the foothills of the St. Paul campus for 30 years, so... Uh, uh, this, is, uh, this is special to be able to talk about a plan. I do commend you for um, um, what the plan, um, how it's developed so far. Uh, we talked this morning about enrollment. The, the conversation kind of wandered into uh, CFAN enrollment and uh, growth. Um, well, if we do this right, uh, this becomes uh, a much more uh, appealing destination for students, uh, and I think it can help enrollment at the end of the day. I do want to ask you to think even bigger about this plan in terms of brand. I'm not sure we should have the word St. Paul campus on this. I think if you look at some of the, I think about Destination Medical Center, think about how neighborhoods or areas create very different names uh, that describe the activity and appeal to the public. This is a much more approachable campus than Minneapolis. I mean, this is because of the bell in ways that most of us didn't understand, along with everything else that's going on there. The public, I think, can connect here, but there has to be a name around this that will draw them in. And, they ha and you've alluded to some of the connecting points and the, the the, the arteries that would do this, but i much more intentional about connecting all the public activities so that when they go to one, they'll go to other destinations. Um, I don't know who, how that conversation goes, but we can't rename any other campus. We can't take the hometown name away, and I, even though I like the St. Paul name, it used to be called the Farm Campus, but, you know, I don't know what it is, but I think somebody should think about Think about that. This, uh, there's a lot of developable land here. Uh, I'm glad you're looking at that Commonwealth Terrace site. Some of the land is, by today's world, is is you know, crying out for redevelopment. The land is worth a lot. Uh, there, you have areas of the golf course that are sort of sensitive conversation areas. I don't know how you're going to phase this or how you you uh, um, if you can finish all this by December with enough specificity that it has. Uh, that it has uh, has some meaning. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Beeson. Um, Regent McMillan, you have asked to talk. Thank you, Chair Anderson, and uh, I echo much of what my colleague Regent Beeson just said, but would uh, would add to that that it feels to me, and you know, my, the precedent for me and my service on the board was as we came to grips with a housing and medical approach for this campus and that was that had lots of starts and stops and uh, we don't need to go back and revisit it but it wasn't until I got comfortable with the idea that we had articulated a relatively clear longer term strategy around housing and academic medicine that I started to get much more comfortable with supporting the component parts of what that meant for for Vice President Bertelson and his operation and you did the pink orange and you know red diagrams the flyovers all that stuff this has the early feel of that so what's my the gist of my comment here and I'd really be interested in 
in a, you know, perhaps President Kaler's perspective. But I think we have to first articulate a clear long-term academic strategy for the St. Paul campus. And, you know, there's CFANS, there's CEHD elements, there's College of Biological Sciences, and then, of course, animal and ag research, which is perhaps the core of what's going on over there at times. And once we have that, then implement a campus plan that supports the academic strategy. So this may have its, uh, it may be bound up in our law, in our system-wide strategic plan discussion, but I haven't gotten to the point where I'm totally comfortable with that academic strategy yet. And I know you're not asking for approval here. You're giving us things to think about. Love that. Thank you. But I, I got to see that academic strategy advance for the, uh, the Beeson campus, and then we can go forward. <laughs> well Thank you, Regent McMillan. President Kaler, did you want to make a comment? Thank you, Chair Anderson. I would, Regent McMillan. Um, there's lots of trains moving in, in parallel uh, in this space, and for right now, that's okay, because I think um, the spectrum of academic opportunities on the St. Paul campus is actually pretty, rot, pretty wide. And you can make an argument that we should make it smaller and more focused, when you can make an argument that we make it larger and more, more comprehensive. And I think uh, as we continue to develop the, the strategic plan and, and um, the, the strategic plan for the Twin Cities campus continues to be refreshed, we'll see some of that uh, emerge. But the framework, I think, is pretty, is pretty clear. We're not going to move the veterinary medicine hospital. And, and what we have to do in vet med, and that's sort of the, the area four um, zone on, on this map. Uh, we're certainly not going to move sea fans uh, away from, from uh, the, the farm uh, land that is there. Uh, and so the, the research components that get carried out in the quadrant that's, that's named two and showing new building in Buford Circle, uh, the bulk of that is going to remain. Now, if we push and pull on design and pull design to this campus, and um, CEHD maintains a, a presence on uh, on St. Paul campus, uh, that, those those are secondary things, and I don't mean to minimize their importance uh, of the overall plan. The same with CBS, very likely uh, to stay on on this campus. So, what we're offering here really is an early look, uh, and and asking for feedback around uh, the two key kind of new things. One is the the partnership quad, you know, we talk about the need for uh, for a research um, uh, incubator for, for a tech park. Um, some people think about putting one to the east of this campus. That could be a component. This could be a component like that using the land uh, in three. And last and, and maybe most importantly as an opportunity uh, is to uh, to the, the Como Street uh, boundary of the Beeson campus. Uh, that land is absolutely worth more than it's being valued at right now. We have, a, I think, an important obligation to maintain uh, low-cost uh, housing, particularly for, for uh, married uh, students, for families, uh, but it doesn't have to be in the kind of miserable shape that that is now. And we're also uh, losing, I think, a, a great retail opportunity uh, along that, uh, that Como uh, boundary. Uh, and it is true that there is not a uh, hotel uh, that we can house guests that come to the St. Paul campus within a, a easy uh, drive of, uh, of uh, this location, uh, unless you come really all the way to the Minneapolis campus. I think that's pretty fair to say. So those are the components, and in my thought, I, I don't diminish the, the need for, for there to be a sharper uh, uh, academic strategy, and I, I think that will come. But we wanted to get your overall thoughts as we're noodling on this part of the St. Paul vision. Thank you, President Kaler. Uh, Regent Lucas. Thank you, Chair Anderson. Um, well, I just love this kind of brainstorming, and you can kind of start to visualize how things could get better and have a better sense of place. Something that has always stuck out to me, though, is sort of like one of these things is not like the other, is the Goldstein Gallery. It's always seemed a little bit out of place over there, and I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about the future of the Goldstein. Um, Mr. Chair, Regent Lucas, um, as the President alluded to, um, throughout the planning effort, we asked real clearly at the very beginning, what things do we think that are in St. Paul, 
might want to or be better in Minneapolis, what things in Minneapolis might want to or be better in St. Paul. In the end, there was very little um, shift. The, the one programmatic um, direction was that things from the College of Design um, would be interested in being consolidated with the rest of the College of Design in Minneapolis campus, which could include that um, museum. We don't have a solution for that. Again, these are concepts. Um, and then pieces of CEHD would fill that space because there's things, as, as has been alluded to, St. Paul campus is easier to uh, get into, so certain programs benefit from that access. Um, and CEHD has had several that they think would fit best in that location. So I think it's right to think that uh, that um, the Goldstein Gallery could uh, come with the College of Design to the Minneapolis. We again are at that uh, concept stage and don't have a, a plan for that, um, but that is being talked about, and I think that's a that's one of the ideas being forward. Uh, Regent Lucas, um, just to follow up, I, I've heard, and I don't know if it has any reality to it that. The old Bell Museum would be an ideal spot for the Goldstein Gallery, right across from the architecture school and so forth. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure that's a heavy lift. Vice President Burleson? Um, I, uh, <laughs> I, uh, several, I, several thoughts have been <clears throat> tossed out. And uh, I think one of the things, um, one of the next um, planning areas for us is, to, is this, that space of the old Bell, the armory, uh, Nolte, this is a, a space that needs of needs some work, mm -hmm. and what makes sense in that? Um, we want to do it not just one building or throw a solution at a building, but think about um, what makes sense in that kind of a small area plan. We do think that that's one of the next planning efforts for us. Thank you. Thank you, uh, <laughs> Regional Mari. Thank you, uh, Chair Anderson, uh, and to the presenters and the work that that's been going into this. Um, a few of the things that I think about uh, are directly in line with uh, Regent McMillan's comments and then uh, President <coughs> Kaler, thank you for clarifying some of the, these components. I do think that there's some areas that we might be able to, you know, certainly say, as President Kaler mentioned, we're not going to move certain things and they're just going to be there and then there might be the opportunity for some other areas to be shifted. A uh, few, few questions that I think about is, is what are the budget implications of this over how long and if I missed that while well, I was out I apologize you don't need to answer any of these now um, I'd, I'd also be curious I know I think it says we have about 2100 full-time staff that are housed on the St. Paul campus but what's the overall foot traffic so if you know one-fourth of students have at least one class does that mean that the you know humanities student who has most of their classes in West Bank are going for one class a week and then leaving and never coming back um, for the rest of the week, so what some of that traffic looks like, uh, and that'll directly align with how we want to uh, grow from the academic standpoint as well. Uh, and then fundamentally agree about the housing component uh, in mission fulfillment. We mentioned earlier today that 25% of our students are graduate and professional students, and so uh, maintaining what it will hopefully be affordable and livable conditions that are not in the red on our critical mass uh, or critical building index because both of our graduate student housings uh, have been in the red since I was living there and probably before then uh, and continue to be. So I think we have a responsibility in that area as well. Uh, and the president seems to agree with me. Hopefully the board does as well. Thanks. You guys have any follow up with that or? Um, I just say briefly, um, Mr. Chair, Regent Damari, um, yeah, we don't have any um, we're t way too early to put any dollars toward this picture. Um, this isn't a, a capital investment plan yet. It's more, it's a broad, um, very long-term set of direction to guide our planning and uh, the kind of ideas that would go forward. So coming from this, at the end, the conclusion of completing this framework, what would then be launched is, is a series of more targeted plans for example, then you might go on to do a pre-design for the next student union, which would then put a price to that, which has a placeholder in the six-year capital plan, which we'll be talking about soon. So I don't have any of those dollars yet. We're much too premature at this kind of idea vision stage. Um, from a traffic count, we do have lots of information about that. We could give answer that more clearly later. I think um, we've estimated the maximum foot traffic is about 2,000 people a day so they're coming through so it's at a given time 
So, um, but we can, there's lots of ways to do that count. And we actually did some very creative <laughs> things to track, track people to show where they went through the day to show motion maps. So we could see the pathways of where they walked, where they drove, where they came from. So we have a great deal of information uh, to help guide that um, planning. Um, that's probably where I should stop for now. Thank you. Uh, Regional Mario has a follow-up. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the second part of your answer, that's kind of scary, but I'm yeah. glad that we can map that out, uh, where people are going in their traffic. Um, Only when they told us and wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be uh, real clear about that. And then the, the sec or to the first part of your answer, you know, the coming back to the academic planning side of things, it would be hard to create schematic designs or get a bid or, and I'm probably not going to use the right, uh, right language, of how big a student union should be if we don't know how much we want to grow the campus, right? And so it seems like we're almost going in a little bit of a, a circle here, but uh, I think it's important to be able to say, all right, well, we want to grow by this much, so we should put together schematic designs for a student union or that might be, you know, bigger than what we have currently, but that's where we want to go. Yeah. Um, so anyways. So yeah. Mr. Chair, Regional Mario, only to that point, we did not highlight or focus uh, kind of on student or individual programs and projections, but we do have that sort of information where we are by program, number of students, number of right. classes right. by day, by time of day, um, and suggestions of projections for how far, how far that could go. Um, and we know that how the net would be from design coming in CHD, the transfers and colleges growing. So we do have a, a sense of that that would go into and be part of the programming for the student future student future infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Vice President Bertelson. Regent Simonson. Thank you, Chair Anderson. <clears throat> um, maybe this ought to be referred to as a grand plan, not just a plan, but uh, as an overview, I like it very much. Uh, I'm particularly like, uh, uh, interested in, I think President Kaler probably addressed it a little bit, but I want to make sure I understand the Buford Circle area mm -hmm. and the research. Uh, um, as you know, you've, we've talked before about what other universities are doing. My company's been involved for the last couple of years with North Carolina and one of the largest livestock uh, companies in the world down there. We've helped them design, a, the, the university put in these laboratory space. We helped them design it, equip it, staff it, so on and so forth. And I'd really like to see something like that move forward here, if I understand it right. If that's what you're, what you're planning to do with this, it also is an opportunity to take research to another level before it's out licensed, get more value out of it. It's also an opportunity for uh, uh, expanding the curriculum, teaching, giving the students more uh, on hands uh, type of, of an education. Is, do, am I understanding that plan right? And if I am, can we start tomorrow? <laughs> any answer on any of that, Dean Burr? Chair Anderson, Regent Simonson, you hit, or you hit it right on target. That's exactly our goal for this, is to bring a connection between industry and government and university, because many of these problems are broader than any individual set of that group and try to bring in that hands-on experience, give those students that experience, bring that research in that's relevant to the industries and the, and the people that are gonna benefit from that. And that's exactly the concept that goes in this. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Regent Rocha. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, in, in getting at uh, Regional Mari's um, uh, concern, you know, to, to use President Kaler's you know, fancy engineering term, these things in parallel, I don't know that there's really any way to get around that. And, Actually, much of what I w um, wanted to comment on, uh, President Kaler um, made the points better than I would have. Um, you know, th I think this is really fantastic. And I, you know, obviously having uh, done my uh, first undergraduate experience on the campus, it's, you know, it's important uh, to my mind that, that we do this well. And, and I have a long thought that we, the failure to sort of reimagine the campus in this way has led to just sort of living with what's there for an awfully long time. And then we've had some significant changes even in the undergraduate flow back when the College of Ag was part of the institute and it had its own rhetoric department. You know, there were different classes being offered and well, that moved to the Minneapolis campus. Well, now what happened to the facilities and, and, and so on. But to go to Regent McMillan's question, I, I, clearly an academic strategy is essential. But I would actually suggest that until you actually look at what the possibilities are, it's pretty hard to, to really fully you know, engage in that conversation. 
um, you know, how many, how many years I've been a part of this campus and, and familiar with it, and you really don't realize that you have all the way to Como. That all that land in there, it, it just, I think, has really been underutilized. And, and when you think about the exposure on the Como side, um, I was really excited to hear the president talk about that as an opportunity and, you know, really, you know, as a volume front door, um, the, the things that you can do with that space. Um, I, I, th I think it's absolutely terrific. You know, it, um, and, and Regional Mar makes a great point. You know, you, you, you build a, a student center for 2,000 uh, folks a day, and next thing you know, you're talking about academic offerings that are 4,000. Or maybe you build it for 3,000, and then all of a sudden you realize you've only got 1,000. So um, trying, to, trying to get uh, our arms around that, I think, is really, really important. Um, you know, you think about the, the student center, and you think about um, the condition of Bailey Hall and how those were constructed. Really, just can't really understand how they came up with that design. Um, all respect to the people who did it, but that student center. There's, I mean, compared to to the uh, uh, union on the Minneapolis campus, um, it is. Uh, uh, it, it doesn't really provide any sort of that, you know, kind of sense of community and everything else. So I'm very excited to see this conversation uh, going, and and I actually think that some of this lack of of design for the campus is a part of why it isn't as popular as it might be. If you had a nice quality state-of-the-art dorm or two on the St. Paul campus in a quality student center, you might actually find that there's a great deal of demand. Um, you know, I still maintain that I can get on a, a, one of the, the campus commuter buses in St. Paul and I'll be at Blagan Hall faster than I can walk from right here. Um, so there's some, you know, and that was something that we invested in a long time ago to make a seven minute trip between the campuses and, and, and I think that we should really work on that. And then when you consider the fact that on this campus we're spending, you know, at times $7 million an acre, you know, for uh, land that, you know, that it has not developed in any specific way, the capacity for the frontier on, on this campus I, I think is just exceptional. And, and I, I, I think this is a great opportunity. I think it's a great first step in this process of looking at these kinds of things. And um, I just, you know, would say congratulations on a great first step and I look forward to the continued conversation. Vision Rocha, thank you. And you, you know, you, you said something that, that touched on me that I think about all the time. You talked about imagining the possibilities. Until till we imagine the possibilities, we can't do it. And I think all the time about imagining the possibilities. If we don't imagine them, who's going to imagine them for the future students? So it's, it's part of what we do here. We need to imagine the possibilities. Um, okay, enough editorializing, Regent Shu. Uh, thank you, Chair Anderson. I was <clears throat> wondering if I was going to get a chance to talk today. Um, the, um, <clears throat> I, I agree with uh, my colleagues. Uh, I, when I first heard about this, was actually I read about it in the Minnesota Daily. No one told us this was happening. And so I, uh, at the time I said, well, that just seems interesting given that uh, you know, we haven't nailed down a lot of the inputs to what I would think would normally be part of a strategic plan for uh, St. Paul, uh, such as, you know, the academic side, you know, how many students are we really going to try to have here and all that stuff. But having said that, you know, I agree. It's You guys did a great job uh, coming up with ideas. There's a lot of ideas here. There's probably, I don't know, Peggy, what would you say, a billion dollars of new construction in this picture, maybe more? Yeah. Um, I, I think, you know, there obviously this, this could be a long-term future, but I'm more looking at, uh, at the near term. And I don't even see something um, as basic as maybe the phase two of the Bell Museum on, on this so far. And maybe there is no phase two, but I always heard there was a phase two. And um, so anyway, I, I, I think you guys did a good job. Um, looking at this and coming up with ideas, and I think there are a lot of great ideas here, uh, but I do think that you know, we need to nail down some of the um, other stuff before we start going into this. And the last thing I'll say is that um, I know people want to redevelop uh, parts of this, including the golf course, and you know, I have not, um, I have not really thought much about that, uh, that part of the, the campus. Um, it, it is kind of hilly. Um, but I don't know what, um, what could actually go there. Uh, so I guess that's it. I look forward to uh, having this discussion again after we kind of nail down some of the, the uh, things that uh, would drive the decisions here. Thank you. I've got uh, Regent Johnson, Regent Beeson, and then President Kaler is going to take us home on this, if that's okay. 
Regent Johnson. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And uh, following up on comments of my colleagues, this has to do with perception and culture. Um, and I think it's best asked of students, staff, and faculty, if we were to engage and embark on this plan, is it in the culture of the university, faculty, staff, and certainly the students, if we started a day, those that are here you know, won't be here to enjoy, but is it, is it in the culture that we ought to develop the St. Paul campus? What I'm getting at is, in today's culture, do the students, faculty, and staff say, I would rather be over on the Minneapolis campus as opposed to St. Paul? And is that due to the lack of investments that we have? I'm not saying, I don't want to start a neighborhood fight or anything like that. I'm just trying to get a perception in the field. Are students okay going back and forth and living over there, taking class here, vice versa? Um, Mr. Chair, um, Regent Johnson, um, I'm sure there are many answers to that question depending on who you ask. Um, we have not, we did not do uh, that kind of uh, um, interest poll. We did uh, gave, gather a lot of information about use patterns. Um, I mean, there are some um, data pieces of it. We know, um, for example, that um, some of it's just driven by what's possible. We don't have the possibility for the kind of open spaces, uh, land spaces um, in Minneapolis that we do here. And that's, um, so certain programs are gonna be here because that's what's possible. Uh, from a student likelihood, I, I don't routinely hear um, too much about uh, concerns of students about where they would take a class. Um, I think that we've been benefited by foresight of many people long before me for the transit way to create that speed of, that is pretty easy to get between the two. Um, we do hear um, and can see from where students make their student preferences for which residence hall that they choose for their priorities. Um, they, the priorities are uh, for Minneapolis over St. Paul. Um, so it's, uh, Bailey is the last to fill up and one of the least to have as a priority. And uh, so we know that from a vibrancy, especially, and I speak, this is from a first year student perspective you know, um, and so what do we know from a housing plan that we're going to, Bailey's going to continue to be a first year student experience for uh, at least a foreseeable future. We are, we have in our work plan for with housing residential life that this year to be working more closely with the academic side to see how can we create better uh, living, learning communities with the colleges and the programs on the campus that to find those ties with students who have programs who want to live there. So we're going to continue to try to work at that. And I think long term, I think there's opportunities for more creative sorts of housing um, where you maybe have a farm to table um, dining experience, people who want to grow their own food and then cook their own food. Or, I mean, I think there's a lot of creativity that opportunities over the long term. Um, first year students, I mean, to your question is, uh, are drawn to be where many, many, many more are. And uh, that's kind of where we are today. Um, it's, it is a difficult chicken and egg thing. If you build it, would they come? We don't get complaints about the quality of the Bailey Hall. It's just about the location. But that's, that's a few snippets, but not a comprehensive survey. Thank you. Thank you. Well, if, I, if I'd have had to cook my own food, I would have starved. Uh, Regent Johnson? Oh, that's, that's very good. I think it needs to be taken in consideration uh, uh, as, we, as we move forward. And by the way, congratulations to all of you on this uh, First inning start on the St. Paul campus. I think it's a beautiful layout over there, just a natural layout and how we can enhance that would just enhance this, this university substantially. So uh, thank you for that and, and uh, you know, a billion dollars and we're good to go. Regent Beeson. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. The, um, uh, I was gonna ask about the, the housing it would be interesting to see, for example, where the CFAN students really want to live. I think there's sort of a sense, well, we had a nice storm, they live in St. Paul. I'm not sure that's the case. So I think um, being clearer than this plan has been able to, I, we do need clarity around that issue as to whether we need a new dorm at some point. Maybe time will tell. The other thing, and we'll be talking about in a minute, is, is public-private partnerships. Um, and the importance of them in today's world and on this campus could have that with this 
Buford Circle that Regent Simonson talked about. We would definitely need it if we ever redevelop the golf course. And on the Como side, if we do affordable housing, there are people that are in that business, uh, family housing, subsidized housing, much more than we are. So mm -hmm. I think, you know, they have the capital, they have expertise, and I think we've got it, and we will, but I think that needs to be a leading principle mm -hmm. probably around the, the plan that we're going to look at those look at those engagements. Thank you. Thank you. We're, we're having some really good discussions, so I don't want to stop it now and let uh, uh, Senior Vice President Burnett answer that, and then I've got Regent Shu and Regent Lucas before yourself. President Keeler. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Regent Beeson, that's exactly what we're thinking about, particularly down on that Como end, about public-private partnerships and how do we change the housing stock. But I think going back to Vice President Bertelson's piece at the beginning, if we don't change this downtown feel or getting some vibrancy there, I don't think a new dorm or an improved Bailey Hall is going to fix it. And what I'm compelled by is this idea of potentially maybe putting a student center commons with the library, which has its own challenges there, and trying to take two things, two problems, and make something much better about it with this single potentially single one food service um, that could serve the entire campus. So if we can solve those issues, then I think other things start to get in bit greater demand. So I, I, we're, we're right with you on the opportunity that there may be multiple strategies to try and affect this plan going forward. Regent Chu. Uh, yes, I just want to follow up, uh, Mr. Chair, thank you, uh, on what uh, uh, Vice President Bertelson was talking about regarding, um, you know, tracking of people and figuring out where where they were going, and um, I would say that it's hard to look at the uh, first year data to determine, you know, how many people really want to want to be in Bailey. I know a lot of people end up in Bailey, not wanting to be in Bailey because they're actually um, students um, uh, with classes mostly on the Minneapolis campus. Um, so, and, and Regent Beeson covered this a little bit by saying, you know, where do the CFAN students go? I think that's. I don't, I'm not sure that was the question you were answering, but I think that's the question we need to have answered in terms of where do the students who have primary, have uh, most of their classes primarily on the uh, St. Paul campus, you know, where would they rather live? Uh, and in some cases, they would rather live in Minneapolis, I'm sure, because the transit way is so efficient. Uh, so I don't know. Um, <coughs> what those answers would be, but I would say that if we had actually more students in CFANS, we might not have all that extra capacity in, in Bailey, um, where those people um, would rather be on the other campus uh, end up. Thank you, Regent Shu. Um, Regent Lucas. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for letting me speak twice. Um, <laughs> uh, Commonwealth Terrace is going to be sticky because the people who live there are they think it's magical, you know. They, there's a real um, allegiance there, and I know that I know the issues with the the quality of the buildings. I think public-private partnerships are intriguing, but right now tax credits don't allow students, and, and um, so it's it's just going to be tricky. But I just know that there's a real allegiance to the people that live there, and it's going to have to be done carefully. Thank you, Regent Lucas. President Kaler, did you want the last word on this? Do uh, Chair Anderson, thank you very much. And really, just two points. And one is, is Regent Roche is out of the room. But uh, before we go nuts on Como, I should point out, in all honesty, that the upper right-hand portion of the green space is not a smudge; it's a swamp. <laughs> I mean, wetland. So there's uh, there's there's some restrictions on how much of that uh, space can be uh, can be safely developed. And the final point is that we also have great opportunities here, perhaps in conjunction with, with uh, other retail and a, and a hotel, uh, for featuring uh, the CFAN's products, whether they be solid or liquid. And I commend Brian Boer for not bringing up his desire for a brew pub in that location in this presentation. So thank you for that. Thank you, Mr. Thank President. you, Vice President Bertelson, Dean Burr. Thank you very much for, for being here and answering our questions and bringing us this exciting plan for the future. Uh, with that, our agenda has a 15-minute recess. We're going to take that right now, but it's going to be a 10-minute recess. We'll reconvene at 3.15. Thank you. Thank you.
We don't have a quorum anyway. The next item on the agenda will be our six-year capital plan, and what goes along with that is the 2019 state capital request. This is just going to be for review. We are going to have uh, Senior Vice President Burnett, Vice President Bertelson, and Dean Jacob Tolar of the, the medical school present to us. But I think we're going to start with uh, President Kaler having a few words first. Is that correct? Thank you, uh, Chair Anderson. Indeed, uh, you've introduced the, the team. They're going to share uh, our priorities for the 2019 state capital request. And you will see that it's uh, focused uh, and forward looking. And it's also tightly linked to our strategic plan uh, and the organizational ideas therein. Uh, but as you might guess by the presence of uh, Dean Tolar, uh, we also then have a very forward-looking and exciting opportunity uh, for development that uh, we're eager to share with you and get feedback as part of our six-year capital plan. So with that, Mr. Chair, with your permission, I'll turn it over to Vice President Burnett. Vice President Burnett, if you want to uh, go again, you look a lot like the last guy that was just sitting there. I got it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Um, we're getting our our slides up as we speak, but the six-year plan is required by the board. Um, it is prescribed in board policy, and it is the official document that sets the direction for major capital projects. And because we have limited resources and limited capacity for projects, we must ensure our highest priorities show up in this plan. Um, our university priorities do change, as does the makeup of the state legislature, the economy that supports state bonding. So this plan provides some variability out in the out years because things change and uh, things happen. And finally, this is the tool we use to build future state requests and capital budgets. In fact, one of the major purposes of the six-year plan is defining future capital requests from the state. Still trying to catch up to me. There we go. Thank you. So there are two primary pieces that inform our capital plan. First and foremost are our mission priorities. These are gathered from our chancellors, our deans, prioritized by the provost and the vice president for research, along with the vice president for academic clinical affairs. We also collect and analyze our facility priorities. And as you well know, there are many. The mission and facility needs are balanced against available resources to arrive at the plan before you. So what are our priorities? We need to address poor and critical backlog across this institution. 50% of our buildings are over 50 years old. Half the buildings at this institution are over 50 years old. Maintenance only goes so far and everything has a lifespan and things wear out. The health sciences portion of our campuses is 35% of the poor and critical space of the entire institution. And quite frankly, the St. Paul Labs has the second highest concentration of poor and critical space at 33%. Another reason to look at that St. Paul facilities plan that we were just discussing. Additionally, we need to look at the student demand in the STEM disciplines. Um, state performance measures related to STEM degrees has increased the need for teaching laboratory facilities. Chemistry is a core component, and an inadequate supply of chemistry labs is restricting our ability to meet demand and move students through the necessary course requirements. This plan includes a major investment in the Twin Cities campus chemistry, as well as major heaper investments in mechanical engineering. Recent investment in Duluth was also in chemistry with the building that's about to be finished there. Finally, we need to reposition our libraries for the 21st century. The days of having the stacks of books um, that fill your libraries are really a thing of the past. And so we need to talk about how do we get the materials still to be accessible, but open these up to be more student-friendly spaces. And so those are the priorities of this capital plan. And in, in the strategic plan alignment, it's essential that our capital plan align with our system-wide academic strategic priorities. As you can see here, this is where we tie the six-year plan goal before you today to one of the elements of the system-wide strategic plan's objectives. Um, we will continue to evolve this capital plan to support the goals and objectives of this plan. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Vice President Bertelson to take the next several slides. Vice President Bertelson, if you'd go ahead, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Regents. As you know, the campus faces a significant 
uh, deferred capital renewal. In fact, we project that over the next 10 years, if we're going to address all of our uh, significant capital needs that impact operations in some way or risk, it would be $4 billion investment over that 10 years. In fact, uh, today we have 8.5 million square feet in poor and critical shape. And frankly, we should be spending twice as much as we do today on renewal. And this poor condition impacts our capacity and our competitiveness. When we look at the six-year plan highlights, um, it starts with HEPR. How do we address those poor and critical spaces and, um, and reinvest in our core um, infrastructure that supports our teaching and research and our outreach? We've identified $200 million a year in HEPR as part of the six-year capital plan. That's a large number, but it reflects the actual need of what the investment should be for the institution. It also continues with our board priorities for projects that you've seen before in child development, chemistry teaching, um, Briggs Library Morris, the Armory, child development, and others, including the Armory. These are outdated buildings that need to be restored to modern standards. In the further years out, we have placeholders for things like St. Paul Campus, which we've just been talking about, Greater Minnesota, and other strategic facilities investments in the future. And newer for this particular six-year plan, where we'll be spending some more time, is a major new health sciences investment in the program, which we'll be talking about for the next several slides. In 2016, those of you who are here in this room were, saw this picture, and uh, Regent McMillan referred to it earlier today. This was a vision of how, over time, we would balance where the location and building of where the future clinical campus would be, moving that with the big idea, moving that to the east along here on Avenue with select replacement of moving housing along the River Road in the Orange Buildings. This was a picture from 2016. Today we're moving, a, kind of refining that picture over time, working not just with the university this time, but working with the University of Minnesota Foundation Real Estate Advisors, jointly thinking about what the east side of campus is. And I just want to talk a little bit about what informs us as we think about that plan. Our six-year Capital plan reflects a strategic view about what's important for the state of Minnesota to build a strong economic base so that Minnesota can compete globally. We know the University of Minnesota plays a pivotal role in that, in that role for the state, and we can help accomplish that goal by educating and training a workforce that is needed to support and attract entrepreneurs and businesses. We do it through generating new research and ideas that lead to technology transfer and new businesses. We do this by creating a vibrant community that's attractive both for the university community for recruitment and retention, but also for visitors, patients, business partners, alumni, and more. We were in a series of planning efforts to create this rich environment to help keep the university a competitive, top research and innovation university. It started with St. Paul. We just talked about making St. Paul a destination site for lifelong learning and industry partnerships, as well as an engaging campus environment for our students. For Minneapolis campus, this works on a set of three initiatives on the east side of the Minneapolis campus. And when considered together, will have a dramatic impact on the university, and this highlighted in this picture. On, to the east of the campus, and the, the purple, just to the east of the stadium, I should say, on the north side is um, the 2407 site. This is what we, we've talked about, a public-private partnership that we're developing, an innovation center to help bring industry to campus for a mutual benefit in research knowledge, transfer, and resources and jobs. We see this as the beginning of a long-desired research park on the Minneapolis campus, in addition to which, you have in your docket information about coming a future land purchase, which would help provide added growth for this idea over time. To the south of the stadium in the yellow blocks is what we're referring to Motley neighborhood. We know from um, that environments and communities matter for business development. It's not just about the space, it's about where it's located. We've seen this in the Amazon proposals, Army proposals, that they are looking for a, a community, an area that's vibrant, and where people want to live and work. Next month, you'll hear in much more detail how the University of Minnesota Foundation Real Estate Advisors is working to create a new engaging development where people want to live, work, create, and connect. And finally, but not least important, is our uh, looking at the clinical research campus of the future. This, again, is in, below that, furthest on the southeast corner there in the red, outlined as a broad general area, not specific spaces, but sort of a bubble diagram of where we see, imagine that growing. Finally, this is corridor emission, and 
central to providing a strong research university, providing the physical infrastructure for a great health sciences program through a set of investments that create the kinds of facilities that we need in the right places. This advancement laid, advances and lays out the future clinical campus for the university, including the next phase of the Blue Ribbon Task Force, the Clinical Research Building, and a series of other components that dramatically upgrade the overall physical condition of health sciences. I want to turn it over for a better summary of the impact of the academic side of that to Vice President for Academic Clinical Services, Dr. Kuhl. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Do I have a permission from you? Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, committee members, President Kaler, Senior Vice President uh, Burnett, and Vice President Bertheson. It is an honor, as always, you know, to sit in your presence and being a part of this distributed brain that guards and, uh, and grows this university. So when we look at uh, the topic at hand today, I think it's very important that as, in, as, as, as tempting as it is to discuss the numbers, the square footage, to, you know, slope over there and a valley over there, a swamp, you know, what do we, as important as that is, you know, in the setting of health sciences that you have been so generous of mine to support through everything that you have done, it is personal. Medicine is personal. Medicine is, as we know, uh, something that will be sooner or later a part of everything that we can think about. And uh, we all have a picture about our lives, you know, that somehow makes sense. And then something happens, you know, a stroke, injury, uh, psychiatric disease, whatever you have, and, and, and everything shattered. And there is no sense to be found. So I think, you know, when we are talking about we're going to put a building over there, we're going to put a little walkway over here, we are not talking about that, really. What we are talking about is what is the mission of the land-grant university and the medical school that you have supported so well? What is the, what is the way how we're going to bring the best possible health care to Minnesotans right now and how we're going to be prepared for transitions that I'm happy to describe to you that I see in medicine and healthcare to come. So all this, and I, I, with your permission, Mr. Chair, I'm going to quote you, you know, imagine the possibilities. You know, that is really, you know, what is, what is paramount to all this. And that inspiration, I would say, has to be paired <laughs> with what President Kaler memorably said, uh, is that excellence, you know, is not a path. Excellence is a matrix. You have to have a discipline. You know, no ideals that I know about make any sense and make any impact on human lives unless there is a hierarchy of focus and a discipline in execution. So that's what, you know, I think we should be looking at when I'm going to tell you that you are, we are building a clinical campus here. What we are doing here is that we are building upon what you have started, and thank you for that, which is the clinical Surgical Center, which is a which is a great building, as many of you, as uh, I hope, you have e either toured it or perhaps you have received services there, and uh, this is a, a part of that vision that we are going after. What we really need to do is now to build upon what the new vice pre presidential office and your, you know, thought in that direction has enabled, which is what are we going to do with the other parts of health sciences that are relevant to human health? And the most prominent about these in this setting of the clinical campus and the clinical research facility is dental clinics. So the dental clinics and many of the health sciences labs, you know, are in the Moose Tower. I don't know if you've been in Havana lately, but Moose Tower, which was finished in 1974, looks very much like a Russian embassy in Havana. <laughs> it's a defensive, brutalistic, kind. Tom Fisher is not here, but brutalistic kind of style of architecture. And uh, added an insult to the injury, in my opinion, is that the code, you know, that it triggers, you know, when you try to rebuild the insides of that building is such an enormous burden, you know, and, and so difficult to do that it essentially can be only office space. So the idea here is, and the, 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 the essence, you know, of uh, our discussion today is that we are looking for uh, focusing on the top priority that I think, you know, needs to come to mind, which is the clinical research facility. So what is this? You know, first of all, again, let me position it in a way that we have learned very well, medicine, engineering, whatever you have, we have learned very well that systems matters. 
system is important. A permissive system makes people think and do things that are almost self-sacrificial. Because that's what you and I see almost every day in our clinics, in our lab, in our administration, that we are betting on people's goodwill. You know, it is the generosity of, that they will take with their minds and with, with their actions that actually creates that commons that is so unique about academia. And that is what, you know, we want to capture in this. So systems matter. You know, if you have a clinic that's dilapidating, that has a really tremendously negative impact on the providers, on the patients, on everything that's happening there, it is impossible to catalyze what we really have at our fingertips, which is the being the leaders, not followers, not reading about this in a, in a paper, but rather creators of where the medicine is going today. And we have, with your help, we have put in place all the foundational scientific pieces that we need. You have here on this campus, and that's what brought me 26 years ago from Cambridge in England here. It's the proximity of, in my case, it was the College of Biological Sciences, College of Science and Engineering, Mathematics, Biochemistry. I thought this is tremendous, you know, because when I look, and, you know, as we all look, you look at Harvard, you look at, you know, San Francisco, you look, you know, at, at, at places in, in Asia and in Europe, they don't have this. You know, they do not have that proximity. So what we have here is we can take the foundational parts of the science that you helped create here, which would be regenerative medicine, one of my favorite. You know, this is going to, add, is going to answer one of the pandemic, you know, that we will see in the next two decades, which is aging and aging-related disorders. You cannot really do this with the drugs and biologicals anymore. You have to be able to reach out to a totally different um, medicine, in fact. You do have the you know, people that are working, you know, in neuroscience, I mentioned the, uh, the neurodegenerative disorders, you have people who have the, the, the deep bench in the biodiscovery district and elsewhere, the medical discovery team that the state has supported, and you, you know, obviously help so much with the Blue Ridge Committee. Uh, you have it all here, but, but what's waiting to happen now is to bring it all together and have, you know, the, the system do, you know, what it does the best, which is catalyze the transition from the technical to a transformational state. And this is where, you know, we are at the moment. And uh, when I look at, and Senior Vice President Burnett said it the best, you know, the, the true asset in at this university or any group of people, not just university, are the people. You know, it, the, the ingenuity and the the, 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 the sheer determination, the force of their convictions, you know, that they bring with them to their work, whether in the lab or in, or in, 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 you know, in the OR or, you know, in clinic, in the intensive care unit or in administration, that is something, you know, that is irreplaceable. So whenever we look at the new faculty, you know, we look at five T's, you know, and the five, the first one, you know, is the territory. And then you have talent, treasure, Time, you have to give them, and, and almost every scientist I've ever seen needs some toys, you know, and we'll talk about a, a toy per excellence, you know, in a later part of the session, but uh, these five T's is really, you know, the, the, the landscape that you have available to this. So giving them the right territory in the, in the form of the clinical research facility would be a tremendous idea and a tremendous advance, you know, on where we have been, you know, to date. What's in a technical terms, what this is going to do, it's going to free up space, you know, in the uh, uh, clinical surgical uh, center. It's going to have, uh, it's going to move some uh, lab space away from Mayo that we have, we have to decommission and, you know, and Mike has been very good at this. Uh, and uh, lastly, uh, with the reconstruction of the hospital, which we call Unit J, but this is the University Hospital, 22,000 surgeries a year. This is one of the best performing uh, hospitals, you know, that you have ever seen. And the structure of this doesn't look that way. You know, it is the people inside of it that make it happen no matter, no matter what. So taking that space, you know, that is not really favoring, you know, that advance that we are after is the essence of having the clinical research facility and move in there in a very smart, proactive way, the co-location and even catalytic function of bump, people bumping to each other in a good way, in a systemic, in a, in a process-oriented way, is really where we are having it. So this plant I see, I see as a, 
as a big ambition. You know, this is something that cannot be done incrementally. Most of the things that truly do matter, you know, in the, in the history of medicine and science, you know, are done as big leaps. And sometimes there are leaps of faith, sometimes there are leaps of uh, intelligence, and many times there are both. And what I think, you know, is happening here, we are at the threshold, you know, that we can take action in a way that we'll ask, why are we doing this? We are challenging the status quo of medicine. We are changing the practice of medicine. We do want people from Bemidji and from Chaska having the same care they would get at Duke or Stanford or wherever. You know, I have a colleague whose son has relapsed uh, lung cancer. And instead of having it done here, I'm not saying that the this is the only and single, you know, uh, example of what we are after. But, uh, but we are the leaders in immunotherapy, and yet we don't have it here. And it's the only, only delta between being there and able to deliver it from the clinical lab to the bedside is, you know, a building of this, this kind and of this magnitude. So instead of being here, you know, he has to fly back, you know, to Duke and have all the therapies done there. And uh, the... You know, and I, I don't want to be too, uh, too close uh, for comfort, but I think, you know, it's, it's obvious that this can happen to anyone. You know, this is not a unique, you know, thing. And we do know that we have to be prepared on behalf of the patients and people who live, you know, in this state and people we train. As you know, we train 70% of the physicians in the state. We have to be prepared with a foundational building, you know, that can drive the events and can establish the access to healthcare in a way that has not been possible. And in my opinion is, in my opinion, the, 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 the access to healthcare is a fundamental human right. And it is really why it is still noble to be a part of a land-grant university and land-grant medical school. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Toller. Uh, um, I'm oh, over sorry. To you. If President Burleson is next, okay. I will. It's hard to follow that, but I will do my best <laughs> on a more tactical level. Um, the remaining parts of the, so I think what I'd like to follow up with uh, what Dr. Toller said is that we are talking about a program. Today we are, um, this is an aspirational big vision, much like the St. Paul presentation. I just want to emphasize what we're talking about is a broad idea that's a collective of many, many moves because we're trying to make that large leap. This is not to make a, one, a series of small things that if we put them in a normal kind of progression could take an enormous amount of time. And I think we feel that we don't have that amount of time to try to make this progress. So again, this is an early look. We have an enormous amount of work to do yet. Um, this also includes as the things that Dr. Toller talked about as well as looking for a consolidated home for public health. And because of our working with our partner over Fairview, how do we create the space that the hospital needs in the short term um, to, to the targeted expansion and the modernization that they need in the short term. When we look at the program total, we're looking at multiple building renovations, lots of different pieces, and new construction that would, out, that would replace outdated facilities. In total, we think that this is approximately $475 million. This is an enormously large number, of course, but really quite prudent, and I'll talk to you about more about why, because the alternative would get you lots of renovation of spaces that never will be functionally adequate. Um, we envision over time that there's need to be partnerships here. This is gonna be a university, it has to be the state, it has to be the foundation, it has to be with our partner Fairview. We don't know the relationships and the pieces of that again, we just know that this is a directional movement and that frankly this builds on many previous planning efforts that we've done before and talked about projects like the clinical research facility, which have been on our six-year capital plan before. So these are pieces that have been in our six-year plan, but are being packaged in a new and sort of way, new way. This, as I said, many pieces, it makes up a large puzzle. This gives you a sense of its multiple locations, multiple dominoes, lots of steps, which as a sell, sold as a collective package, we think, would enable us to move much more quickly and much more efficiently than we would otherwise when we look at the total impact, in spite of the, big, the overall investments, we think that the final outcome would be a net reduction of 400,000 square feet from where we are today. So though there's a big capital spend up front, this is a significant payoff at the end 
but would also, though there's an investment, instead of renovating, putting money into old things that aren't worthy of investment, we would be taking out $350 million worth of deferred capital renewal in place of. And this net, though there would be an operating cost of the facility operating of approximately $2 million. The debt component, though, is real. There is a debt payment. Now, I would argue that we are going to spend that money in existing old, difficult to maintain Mayo building of over 900,000 square feet, or we have the opportunity to put that investment in the right places with the right kind of quality. Um, when we think about my milestones, here we are socializing the idea, the testing with you a big vision that we know that we need to do a lot of refining of the program, enormous refining of costs and funding structure. We are beginning by testing this broad picture with you and making the programmatic case. We know that if we have advances, we think we could be able to take a, pro a program like this, much as we did for the biodiscovery districts to the state, as soon as potentially 2020. Again, this is uh, an idea. And, and if long-term, if that were to be successful, that this would be a multi-year design and construction, much as we've done with Athletes Village or Biodiscovery District. And turning it back to Senior Vice President Burnett. So to, to bring us home on this one, Mr. Chairman and members, this is the six-year capital plan in millions, and the, and the gold would be the state support. And this would obviously be a very big ask, very similar to the TCF Bank Stadium effort, the Biodiscovery District, um, outside the normal process. And you can see, so for 19, we're recommending $232 million in state support, $200 million of that's heaper. Um, but then 2020, if this board were to support this vision for the Health Sciences Center, we would talk about a much bigger number. And then you can see how this number would go out in future years, mainly that those are heaper requests in the out years to maintain the rest of our campus and the rest of our system campuses. The question about debt capacity that um, as we looked at, we have the capacity to do our piece of this. If we look at a typical two thirds, one third with the state, or hopefully even a three quarter, one quarter, which is what we had in the biodiscovery district. So we've modeled out ahead because we've always had a very aggressive amortization schedule on debt we've already issued. We pay off around 80 to $90 million a year of debt. So when we lay this out, this plan under the current on rating of the university under our current debt capacity is actually achievable. It's doable. Now, do we have a lot of things to bring together to make it happen? Absolutely. But if you talk about could the university come up with its third of 475 million and figure out how to how to make that work, it certainly, at least from our early projection, says this is doable. And so we just wanted to share that with you today with this big vision, your first look at this big vision, we think there's room in here to do this. So if, just to wrap up, the 2019 requests that you're just reviewing today and would take action on in October, again, 200 million for HEPR would be statewide, formula-based across our five cam four campuses. We don't have any HEPR at Rochester. We would request the child development replacement facility on the Twin Cities campus at 28 million. We have a very large gift um, and fundraising continues with, uh, with the Dean and the College of Education and the University of Minnesota Foundation. And our third request would be the renovation of A.B. Anderson Hall on the Duluth campus. So very similar to our operating request to the state that we brought you in the couple of items ago, it's a very focused approach, particularly when there's so much turnover at the state capitol, particularly at the governor's level. We know we're going to have a new governor. We don't know what their priorities are going to be. So we think having a very focused um, capital plan in 19 is important. And this child development replacement is some new building adding to tearing off an old building. There really isn't a new building on this list. It's taking care of existing buildings across the entire um, enterprise. So with that, we're happy to take questions about the capital request. We're happy to take questions about the six-year capital plan and this new element that we've added this year around what I would say is the renewal of our academic health center. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, presenters. Uh, 
I, I got brought into this discussion a month or so ago, and it's, it's really exciting to me. Uh, one of the reasons I'm here is I, I want to see our health care build out in, for greater Minnesota and, and producing the doctors, and that, that excites me. And uh, the other thing is our HEPA request and our request for this year is I've heard from a lot of legislators who have said, boy, you've got some shiny buildings and everything like that. Why don't you just take care of what you've got? And that's what we're expecting to do with this year's request. So with that, and I want you to understand, it's just for review today, we're going to start taking questions on either the six-year capital plan or our, our request for this year. Regent Hsu. Uh, thank you, Chair Anderson. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I wasn't expecting that uh, presentation, but I think it's, I think it's uh, a good plan from what I've seen so far. Um, it's not clear exactly what you're going to do with the, uh, the Mayo building, which, as you reference, is almost a million square feet. Um, Mr. Chair, Regent Hsu, um, the, the end, at the very end of this, that building would be eliminated. And so completely torn down? Yes. And then um, just fair um, ground? Mr. Chair, Regent Hsu, um, we don't, uh, this is a, was a big enough kind of a leap for us that we didn't identify specifically what would go there. Uh, from a master planning perspective, um, there are some that we did a couple, brought a couple years ago to the board. It showed potential buildings there without identifying what that program could be. It would be a, a different, smaller scale, leaving more green space, opening up that part of the campus, which is sort of overbuilt. Um, we know that something would go there long term, um, and we have some images we could go into another time, but um, we don't have a plan today for what that would be. But it would be at the at the end of this, we would be the best mail would be gone, and we would be divesting ourselves of deal hall as well. And unit J would be gone. No. Um, long, right now, what the um, in this picture plan that we I presented to you, uh, unit J in the hospital continues to be at the site. But we've identified the long term view of someday, whenever uh, people would think about it, when the hospital that. When there ever, whenever that is, that there would be a new hospital somewhere out in the future that we think the space is, we've identified that future space. And we just want you as a board to know that we've identified and planned for that potential and someday future. But we don't have a schedule or a plan uh, for that. So could you go back to that uh, picture, Yes, sir. Please? I think I saw. I'd like to point out too. This is conceptual region shoe, and, and nothing's in, uh, in in stone or concrete. No, no I understand. Yeah. I, but you know, when you throw out a number, I, I'd like to know what's in that number, kind of. So if you uh, actually, this isn't the picture I was thinking of. It's this the one. Next, no, the. Uh, um, oh. The one with the circles. This one. Okay, so here you have future hospital. I'm not yes. sure where that dot is. Is it on which side of? Uh, is it that block? Then uh, next yeah. to the So what I can clearly say is, if I go back to, frankly, this is a better picture for me to give you a sense of this. Collectively, we haven't, what, at the, this level of planning is a broad and very long-term vision. The southwest area, sort of in that um, orange, now kind of pinkish, dark pinkish, um, it's yet to be determined where exactly which of those blocks or spaces the hospital for sure would be. We know that collectively we need to build the clinical research facility. We already have the clinical surgery center. We know we need to build the hospital. There's going to be hospital support space. There's going to be parking. Um, the, this is not a massing study. This is a, a land space plan. Right. And so collectively in that set of five blocks, um, that's, what, that's the best answer I can give you for where that would be today. We believe that collectively that set of blocks is sufficient for the kind of space and the program that we're imagining for the future. But we have not yet done that kind of specific plan about what would make sense in what location yet. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, I was just a little confused because Unit J is gone in this picture. <laughs> um, yes, it, the idea is we we're just trying to show that long term the direction is whenever the hospital would, similar to the this prior before, that whenever the hospital moves and we're not projecting or say, giving any sense of when that would be, that we think that from the, that along the river road is a space that future housing would make sense and that the hospital would make sense further to the east. So it's, it's a directional move with a long-term sort of land, land use plan is really what this is as opposed to a facility plan. 
Okay. Uh, thank you. So on on the six year plan or on the uh, capital request, you know, my concern about the capital request is that um, well, the six year plan, you know, we have projects that come and they stay on there forever, and then we have projects that completely leapfrog it and. Um, I have a problem with how we use it and what it actually represents uh, for us to think about. But you started your presentation by talking about STEM, and I thought you were going to talk about chemistry, because that's something that has been identified for a long time as uh, pretty much the bottleneck in science and engineering and why we can't increase the size of um, that college. And I understand that, you know, the um, Child Development Center is the project of choice this year. But without a strategic plan that shows me how that, compare, that need compares to the need of the other colleges, um, I have a hard time supporting it. And I think it's, uh, it's just, it just shows that, you know, we really need to have some idea of where we're going. And I don't feel like we have that yet. And it's just every year it's a free for all and whatever pops out that year is kind of what we're going to put up on the, the capital request. So I can't support it, but, um, you know, I have other problems with that project that uh, we, I can talk about later, but uh, right now I don't really understand how that project got to be on the top of our list. Uh, uh, Vice President Bertelson, you want to answer that? Yes, uh, Mr. Chair, Regent Shu, uh, a couple specific things. Chemistry teaching is in the 20 in the document, and we didn't go through each of the years of the six-year capital plan to highlight this, but it is in the document. Um, as chemical chem teaching is in the 2020 state capital request, so and um, both this and the child development center were in set the last several six-year capital plans as well. What I can say, sort of broadly, is though there are adjustments in the six-year capital plan over my 25 years. Um, once you get into that, the vast majority of those projects move forward and do get funded. It's a rare exception where they end up coming off the list in total. And most of the vast majority of them do progress, not all within six years, of course, um, but to the continuity of the projects and the priorities, both of the child development plan and the chemistry teaching building have both been in the prior projects in requests, and they continue to be so. Um, it's more of a balance of, as Senior Vice President Burnett said, of the size of the, what a capital request would be for this 19, which is effectively an off year for bonding. Um, so it's a more targeted, it's, just a, it's a size and balance issue. And frankly, from a planning perspective, chem teaching has been part of the 2020 request uh, for several years. Regent Shu has a follow up. Uh, well, and that's. Uh, I, I guess that's okay, but I, I think instead of, it might be a better strategy to move that one up and to reduce the size of HEPR. I mean, we always ask for a big HEPR amount, but HEPR gets reduced to, I mean, what was HEPR this year? It was 200, request was 200 last year. Um, what did we get uh, this Mr. year? Mr. Our request for two, was for 200 million yeah, 200. and our actual was uh, 45. 45. Yeah, so I, I would rather ask for a building that uh, we absolutely need and can demonstrate the need for, rather than going throwing up a number uh, of 200 and getting 45 at the end of the day. It makes our requests just look terrible to have that big a number that nobody really is interested in funding. That's just another strategy. I mean, I think there, there are people that will agree with you, Regent Shu, and people that will disagree, and the same with, with uh, Vice President Bertelson. I think that's a strategy to talk over. Talk over. Uh, Regent Lucas. <laughs> Chair, um, I want to congratulate you for putting forward the big idea. I totally agree with uh, the things that uh, Dean Tolar was talking about. I think to, to dream for anything less is not a service to the people of Minnesota. We really have to start thinking big and not sinking money into rehabilitating buildings that will never be adequate. So I really congratulate you on that big thought. I have one question about Moose Tower, the one you um, describe as the Soviet Embassy in Havana. Um, I get my dental work done there, and I would agree with you. And it, so the plan is for Moose Tower, it stays, mm -hmm. becomes office. Is um, that? Mr. Chair, you want to talk about that? We've actually got on the docket to remodel a little Moose Tower today. 
okay. Yeah, Mr. Chair, Regent Lucas, yes, Moose Tower would be, uh, would continue to be a, um, a facility we plan to keep for a very long time as we would with PWB. Um, but we, we, looking at the infrastructure capacity of it, there are certain things that are easier to renovate in that kind of facility, and I think Dr. Tolley referred to. Um, our assessment is that, that the best reuse of that facility long-term is for office administrative tasks, and that we are planning and are actively doing that, Include, in, in fact, part of the PWB renovation is part of the Health Science and Education Center. So we're making in, improvements in the infrastructure, but we think long-term that certain things make sense in different locations, and that's where the investment is, that the dental, we think, makes more sense in the clinical campus, more easily accessible than we find the access in um, okay. PWBN. But we fully intend this to be a long-term facility. Thank you. Regent, uh, Regent Beeson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would mm -hmm. echo uh, uh, Regent Lucas's comment about a big, uh, a big idea. I would encourage um, you to com communicate with the board during the next year, because the year is going to go quickly. And this, uh, this, is a, this is one of the largest, not the largest, investment we will make. Uh, this board will, will um, uh, we'll make there does need to be more clarity around these other buildings clarity about what gets decommissioned what the impact on operating costs we will have new revenue from the affiliation agreement hopefully and uh, so seeing how this gets uh, how this gets funded I would be more explicit and not timid about a hospital that we're going to probably need one so um, uh, having that out there but I think and I did, you know, um, I used to get more sort of concerned about the velocity of project changes in the six-year plan, but, you know, given the highly dynamic world of healthcare and our relationship with Fairview, I, I guess I've come to accept sort of these um, projects like this um, appearing more suddenly than they, than they maybe would have um, in, in years and decades past. So uh, good work. Uh, the clinical building, I was actually a patient there this last month, and I'll say it's very, very busy. A lot of parking queued up outside, so I don't know if we need to be talking about an addition there yet or some remodeling, but it looked like it was, uh, looked like it was quite active uh, at that space. Thank you. Uh, I'm chuckling. You as a patient there, I'm not going to talk about it, but Regent Omari. Regent uh, Omari. Thank you, Chair Anderson. I think I'll be brief. Um, just want to note that... Um, the Child Development <laughs> Center, to my knowledge, was a conversation that started when we toured it three-ish years ago. <coughs> Seems appropriate, uh, also coupled with the fact that we've got some donors. So I think the, the room for adjustment when we have a situation like this makes perfect sense. And then the second thing uh, I'm reminded of, I believe last year we shifted our strategy to go more for uh, repairing and taking care of the buildings that we have via HEPR because the old way we used to do it was actually to try and build new stuff and then less on the heaper. And the advice that I recall from our partners uh, at the legislature was, well, why don't you take care of what you have instead of trying to build a bunch of new fancy stuff? So uh, if, if I, I don't know if one year is long enough to say that it hasn't worked and, and go back to the other way, but I do remember an actual discussion uh, that did take place in, in strategizing from our friend or my friend here on the right as well. Uh, so. Thank you. Vice President Burnett. And to that point, uh, uh, Regional Marine members, we also got Pillsbury's capital renewal in addition to the HEPA request. So it wasn't just HEPA that was given to us last year. Pillsbury had been on the list for a very long time. And so with a lot of Regent help, you know, it wasn't just Heaper that we got at that message, and so renewing Pillsbury for the first time in over 100 years is also on the list now, thanks to a lot of work. So. Uh, Regent Sigum and then uh, Regent Cohen and thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to echo uh, Regent Amari. I think the uh, the Heber request is so very very important. That's where our priority ought to be, um, and especially as our government relations group can let legislators know specifically what buildings are going to be taken care of, what are going to be maintained. You can put a brick and a mortar to a request. I, I think that's important. Uh, we, as we get around the the five campuses. Just a quick question, uh, Vice President Bertelson, if I could. Uh, the Anderson Hall in Duluth, mm -hmm. 
very, very important. It's been on our list for four years, I think, in a four-year plan. I believe that's right. And last year, Mr. Bertelson, we got Glen Sheen funded. Yes, sir. And that hadn't been on the list at all. Um, Glen Sheen was an addition this last for this last session. It hadn't been it, on the six-year plan at all. So does that mean that Glen Sheen was more important than Anderson Hall? Or uh, give me a priority there. Um, I forget it. I'm just putting you on this one. All right. I don't speak for the legislature. Yeah, I, 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 I would argue Regents. But we asked for both, Mr. S yeah, we asked for both, we asked and for we both. got turned down on one. Regent two. Uh, thank you, Chair Anderson. If you recall, uh, Regent Swigum. Regent Swigum. Excuse me. If you recall, last year the uh, chairs of the bonding committees asked us to put Glen Sheen on there, and that's why it went on there, because they they wanted to have at least an opportunity to discuss it in committee, and that that was a signal to us that there was an intent to put some money into Glen Sheen. So. That's the only reason that was on there and not on the six-year plan. Correct. I remember that very well, Regent Sue, and also the politics that gets Correct. in the and and Regent Cohen? Here and there. Thank you, Chair Anderson. Um, I agree with uh, very much with uh, Regent Lucas uh, about the plans for the, for the medical school and, and the research, et cetera. Um, I'm a little confused, however, about what is, even though it's far off and it's tentative and so on, what is going well, where, and it would be helpful just to get a list or something. This is what might go into the pink area. This is what might stay near the hospital. Um, this is what is going to be decommissioned, we really think, et cetera, just to get some mm -hmm. idea of what, what the grand plan scheme might be. Not now. <laughs> yeah, I, I, think, I think Regent Cohen is asking for uh, Sure. In a perfect world scenario, what would be where? And what would the time frame of that be, 10 years, 12 years? You know, if we could see a campus map like that that you guys might envision, as, is, that, is that Regent Cohen what you're at? Right, and specifically to the medical things. To the medical side. The whole campus plan or whatever. Yeah. Mr. Okay. Chair, Regent Cohen, uh, great question. And of course, you know, that's what I meant by discipline. That's what, you know, we have been already discussing quite uh, quite a bit, you know, what's going to go where. But I think others have pointed out, Regent Lucas and Regent Beeson, uh, that it is an adaptive uh, thinking. You know, we do know where things are going to go, but how they exactly going to be positioned, I think, especially when one thinks in a scope of a seven, eight years decade, you know, this is something that we are open to uh, adaptation rather than a rigid of course. And I'm, I'm deeply grateful to everyone who, uh, who felt that we should go big. I am, you know, there's no way. You know, this is an Anna Karenina syndrome. You know, there are many ways, you know, these centers fail, right? There's one way how they succeed. This is it. Go big or go home, they say. Uh, Regent uh, Rocha. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I'm encouraged to see the conversation about reducing that footprint, uh, the overall um, part of it, and, and, and going back to a, a point made by Regional Mari a little earlier, um, it's you know I, I, I like old stuff. I like preserving things, you know, taking advantage of it. But then you run into situations like um, uh, the, our, our two-car gambrel roof garage on our property that was moved there sometime around 50 years ago. That it's the wrong footprint. It's too small. You can't open a normal car door anymore. And, you know, so there really is no way to save that. We're going to run into the facilities of that variety, I think, where you just realize that the useful life, the way it's built, um, doesn't, doesn't work. So, you know, and I don't think you're saying that everything needs to be preserved. It's, uh, but obviously, we're finding that balance between things that can be preserved. Obviously, Pillsbury and its history, it's such a unique building. But, you know, my expectation is you might want more windows than Pillsbury has, but in that facility, that's the trade-off that you make and so on. Um, but I, I, you know, I liken it um, to the uh, Leatherdale Equine facility, um, you know, having grown up with, uh, with horses and, and all the mistakes we made with every facility we built where we realized we wished that we'd have made that door two feet wider or we had placed something over here in that process, that's a building that clearly years and years of experience led to making all kinds of very, very smart moves about how they constructed that building. And so for the, with the same space, you can do so much more. 
Um, and, and when you think about the technology that we have now, uh, the ability to, uh, to, to condense this space, and, and I, I've made this statement here before in different contexts where coming back to the board after 20 years um, and coming back on campus, I expected that we would have, you know, we, we've got fewer students than we had in, in, in the early 90s and, and uh, more technology. I kind of figured it'd be sort of less of a physical footprint and I realized that we've built on virtually every blade of grass that existed back then. So it just continued to expand, expand. So the idea that we can take advantage of technology and efficiencies and start to back that down, I think is great. And I would just say as we go, I know you were put on the spot, well, what's gonna go there if you take that down? Let's not be afraid to recapture some open space. Mm -hmm. and, and, and even if you are gonna build, I like the, as you said, that we would try to um, leave some more, some more open space. I think that's good for, good for humanity. Um, but as, as we go forward, I, I was very happy to see that we're talking about this um, and, and those long-term implications. I, I'm still not fully um, uh, up to speed now on, on how we're dealing with when we, we build a new building, do we have to demonstrate the capacity to uh, cover the uh, maintenance costs and operational costs of those facilities because that's always been a problem. You build a building and then now you force the funding of it even though that may not have been part of the discussion when you were talking about your budget. So. Um, uh, there may be issues here and there where I, uh, you know, have have some concerns about various things, and I, I think we'll have the opportunity to have those conversations. But from a from a first blush, I'm I'm, I'm pleased with it. And as it relates to the um, the child care facility and all of that, with the way that process went, I, I, to some extent, from a timing standpoint, um, and you talk about again decisions in parallel. It seems like we've gotten some cart horse issues with when certain conversations were made and certain decisions were made and the, the impact that that has on the community outside of just a facilities basis in terms of our uh, the employees across the campus. I, I think that those kinds of conversations are really important. I don't, I don't like to have a facilities question dictate a programmatic result in something that's not necessarily related to that. And I think that's something that we have to take on as we go forward. But with respect to the six, the, the, this particular plan, I, I think that there's a, a lot of really positive material in there and, and I'm happy to see that we're moving that way. Thank you, Regent Rocha. Regent Beeson, would you have the last word, and then we're going to move on. I'll pass. Then. You'll pass. Uh, presenters, thank you very much. Uh, I would just say that this has been very inspirational seeing this, and we'll see where it goes from here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank uh, you, everyone. To my board colleagues, uh, we've seen the, the future. Now we actually get to vote on some things that are happening now. Um, our next presenters are going to come up, and I believe they're uh, Vice President Bertelson. Are you going to be there for the Becker Sand Plane? No. No. Okay. <laughs> okay. Assistant Vice President Kruger. Okay, Assistant Vice President Kruger. She is going to be there. Okay. So, so if you colleagues remember, last time we met, we talked about the Becker Sand Plane lease. We reviewed it. I'd like to know now if there a motion to recommend approval of the relocation of the Becker Sand Plane Research Farm and a new 30-year lease. Okay. Moved and seconded. Okay. Um, Vice President Kruger, do you have anything briefly you want to say, and then we'll open it up for discussion. Chair Anderson, members of the board, as, you, as Chair Anderson mentioned, that this was reviewed by the Board of Regents at the May meeting. You'll recall that uh, the university has been a long-term lessee of the of Excel Energy up in Becker for some very unique. Uh, soil research there because of the soil conditions in Becker, the sand plain soil. Uh, it's in the heart of Becker, and so Excel has chosen to not renew our lease because it is better suited for economic development in the heart of Becker. They have opened up another 400 acres of property farther to the south, three miles to the south, to allow us to continue our research. It's up to a 60 year lease, and the uh, the um, Proposal in front of you today is to allow us to enter into that up to up to 60 year lease along with the leasehold improvements that would go along with that. And your department recommends we do so. We recommend this approach. Okay, there's a motion and second on the table. Any discussion from my colleagues? If there's no discussion, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to bring uh, Assistant Vice President Gritters and uh, Dean Tolar, I think, up to the uh, platform. We're actually going to talk about the Mass Spectrometer Room Expansion Center. And I, I consider that it's a biodiscovery district, isn't it? The Cancer and Research mm -hmm. Building. Um, we've sent out a lot of this because we're asking for your review and action today. Something as chair committee, I do, as 
as a so committee chair, I do not like to do, but um, we have funding for this through the Masonic Medical uh, people, and they want to get started. And so I'm first going to ask for a motion to recommend approval of the amendment to the capital improvement budget for the mass spectrometer room expansion in the cancer and cardiovascular research building. So moved. Is there a second? Uh, at this time, I will ask Senior Vice President Burnett or the, the other presenters to say what they would like about this, and then we'll open up for questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll turn it over to Assistant Vice President Gritters and Vice President Tolar. But I've talked to many of you about this. It is all gift funded, and it is research imperative to get this moving. So, please. We've got a short Mr. presentation Chair, here, right? I'll take. Oh, you want to go first? I'll do the introductions, okay. Mr. Chair, Committee members. Uh, this project involves renovation to address two needs relating to the Cancer Cardio Research Building uh, in the Biomedical Discovery District, as indicated. Uh, the first need is to convert space to address current and projected need for additional mass spectrometers. And then the second is converting currently underutilized kitchen space uh, to provide much needed freezer farm space in the building. Uh, Vice President Fuller will speak to the project need. Mr. Chair. Uh, well, committee, Mr. President, Senior Vice President Burnett, everyone. Uh, it is a pleasure, you know, to have a, what I would hope would be one of the easiest items on your schedule today because this is fully funded from private funding. The Minnesota Masonic Charities are the largest benefactor of this university and uh, they have done something uh, quite quite exciting. They not only gave, you know, a significant amount of money to the university, but also they uh, decided to accelerate the the pledge, you know, towards the end, you know, of that period. And uh, they worked with um, Dr. Doug Yee, who is the director of the Masonic Cancer Center, who is here in the room present at the moment, and uh, together designed a way that would be the best placement for that accelerated pledge. So that is the mass spectrophotometer. So what is it? What is what is what does this do? So uh, just a very very briefly, may I? Um, okay. So um, if you look back at uh, you know at Anaximandras or uh, Democritus, you know that's where the atoms you know were first, and then they were you know conceived as possibility. They have been forgotten for 1600 years and then you have Galileo and Newton coming you know with the laws of physics and then you know at the end of the 19th century you have this enormous just just one of these unbelievable marriages you know of knowledge between Michael Faraday and uh, John Maxwell so one is you know the one who feels science you know and he feels that these atoms you know cannot be static they have to be waves and that's what the electromagnetic field is, you know, based on. And John Maxwell is a mathematician. You know, Scott, one of these phenomenal mathematical minds, and he puts it in equations. So since that time, we know that it actually does matter how uh, how the you know fields you know move. And when you look at uh, at, at blue, you know, of uh, um, on, on your coat, you know, that's where the waves go very quickly. And when you look at red, you know, they go a little slower. You know, that's what it is. And mass spectrophotometer basically uses the advantage of the fact that you can look at a piece of, in this case, a human tissue, and you can detect traced elements by how these waves, how these electromagnetic fields interact with that piece of tissue. This is very important because this is one of the most accurate ways, uh, and Regent Simonson, of course, knows very well what I'm talking about, and everybody else. Uh, one of the best ways how to detect impurities, you know, in uh, in anything. And we have had a phenomenal advance at this university in a study of Dr. Robert Turetsky about the cooked and processed meat, for example. How does this pertain to human health, you know, over, you know, years or decades of the time? And that is where the new machine is going to be used for, you know, for him. There are eight other machines, you know, they're going to be co-localized, as you have heard, you know, in that space. And then we need to store the samples somewhere. And that's where the kitchen where nobody ate, I'm mean, not nobody, but you know, there were very few people <laughs> there. That's where this is gonna, that's what this is gonna be used for. So this is a way how take a knowledge that has been built at this university and advance it in this, in this elegant step into the next level. And this way, 
do well with the pledge that we have gotten and simultaneously enable the research and the clinical application at the highest possible level. When I first had this on the agenda, I had to make sure that it, it wasn't a clinical machine, it was a research machine, and so it's, it's research driven. Yes, it is. So it's on the table. Is there any more discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, our next item, item seven, is a capital budget amendment. Uh, Assistant Vice President Gritters, I think you're going to stay there. Vice Chancellor, I suppose, from Duluth is here. And we're going to talk about ice refrigerant and the HVAC replacement sports and health center Duluth. Uh, just for review. So if you could briefly go through and tell us what you want to do there. And then I'm also going to say if, uh, if Allie, Ms. Uland, is Ms. Uland in the audience still? Oh, you're, oh, I didn't know you were sitting there. But you're sitting there, otherwise I would ask you the table because I know you've supported this and I'll ask for your opinion. Yes. All right, Mr. Gritters. Mr. Chair, committee members, thank you. This project involves correcting two deficiencies relating to the Sports and Health Center at the University of Minnesota Duluth campus. The first is correcting and updating HVAC deficiencies, and the second is addressing uh, the outdated ice refrigerant system re relating to the ice rink that exists within that building. Um, as you may know, uh, the, the current HVA system, HVAC system was inadequate to remove the humidity at some key times during the year, so this spring, some mold was identified in the space that has since been abated and the space repainted. Um, however, uh, until the HVC system is replaced, um, the ice cannot be reinstalled into the building. Um, secondly, we have an issue with the ice refrigerant system, which is outdated, uses R22, which is a chlorofluoro Carbon. Carbon. CF, I, I don't CF. have the quite Good. the terminology yeah. down. Um, so those two things have to happen at the same time before we can proceed. Um, the replacement of the R22 was included originally in the uh, annual capital budget at 1.2 million and subsequently the need to replace the HVAC system was identified. Um, so again, the HVAC, impro HVAC improvements include removal and replacement of the existing HVAC system and the replacement of the existing ice rink refrigeration system for environmental benefits, for environmental requirements. Uh, turning to the cost, funding, and schedule, um, the estimated cost is 3.6 million. Again, uh, the capital funding is 1.2 million worth of uh, University of Minnesota Duluth funds and 2.4 million of university debt. Project schedule, the uh, HVAC upgrade design is complete. Refrigerant design would be completed by December of 2018 and construction complete by summer of July, July of 2019. Thank you. Um, Ms. Euland, we all, I think, at least I got it, I assume everybody else, got a, um, an item from the UMD Student Association. Um, President Mike Kenyatta, Jared Hagan, Chair of the Congress, and you uh, were also listed on there as a uh, presenter. And do you have anything you want to say about your involvement from the UMD Student Association and what the students think about this project? Yeah, thank you, Chair Anderson. Um, really, the reason why we passed that resolution at Congress is that we really find that this is a student issue on campus and this is a culture issue on campus. So this ice rink in question here is the only ice rink on UMD's campus. Um, we're coming off of a national championship win for our hockey team last year, and hockey is truly embedded in the culture at UMD. Um, I found out just last week that about 90% of students use the RSOP facilities and services. So that means about 90% of students are walking past this ice rink into RSOP. They're seeing people playing hockey, broom ball. They're seeing people learn how to skate. They're really seeing this hockey culture on the campus, and it's something that's widely used by students and something that keeps students coming back each year ready to play intramural hockey and club hockey and all of that um, and engage with it on campus. So that's kind of why students can see this as such an issue is that we really do have this hockey culture on the campus, and we really do believe that this is something that's important to student life on campus. Terrific. I have a son that plays intramural hockey, so I know how important it is. Just, just briefly, uh, Regent McMillan, are, are, will you be supporting this? I'll be voting yes. Okay. And lastly, again, it's just for review. Um, 
Vice President Burnett, we went over debt capacity and issues yesterday, and this is in our scheduled debt capacity, yeah, correct? This is well within our ability to finance this for the campus and very supportive. Any questions? Of, we're not going to vote on it today. Are there any questions? Regent Shu. I was just wondering, uh, so it's going to be university debt, but um, where does the um, where do the payments come from for that debt? Just out of the uh, <clears throat> senior vice president Burnett. Um, Mr. Mr. Chair, thank you, Regent Shu. The campus will pay that back over a schedule that we'll work on, but uh, they they had a limit of how much funds they had on hand, and, and they're just not sufficient. So they'll pay the camp they'll pay the university back. And very common for us when there becomes a an issue like this where the building isn't serviceable without our support. So it's one of the values of our system working together across the campuses. Thank you. So it, it is UMD. We'll dead. be paying it back. Okay, thank you. That's right. Uh, I think that's all we need to know today. Thank you, presenters. Thank you. We're going to turn to the... Um... Oh, I'm sorry, Regent Beeson. Uh, no, I'm sorry. I, no, I, 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 um, Mr. Chair, um, I want to go back to the last presentation, actually. Is there somebody still here from the Masons? I think was here. Mr. President. Mr. President. Uh, Chair Anderson, um, Regent Beeson, I don't think there was anybody here from the Masons charity themselves. Okay. Well, I, did, I just wanted, before we, we, we left that completely, uh, acknowledge, I know what a great relationship that they've had with the foundation, with the president, but, you know, we owe them so much for what they've done for this university. Yep. Ongoing. Uh, ranging children's health to uh, uh, to this last uh, project and others. So I just wanted for the record. I appreciate uh, that. Uh, my mother would have been disappointed with me. I didn't say thank you to him. So um, sometimes I forget. But, yeah, there's a lot of people that have done a lot of philanthropy here, and we, we can't ever forget to, to thank them enough. Um, consent report, we're going to be asking for review and action. I'm just going to basically what I see on there, and somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, we've got the purchases. The Moose Tower Remodel Schematic, the University Village Proposed LLC, a approval of a contract for the Vice, Pres the Vice President of Equity and Diversity. And since we passed the, the, um, the spectrometer, we now have the mass spectrometer schematic design becomes a part of that. And they want to get that approved. What I'm going to do is, I've been told there may be people that want to discuss some of these items. What I'd like to do is I'm going to ask you if there are any items in the consent report that members of the committee wish to separate out. If so, we will separate that out, and then I'm going to uh, ask for a motion for the rest of the consent items first, get it passed, and we'll go to whatever somebody might separate out. So is there any motion to separate any of those items out? Regent Chu? Uh, yes, Chair Anderson. I would like to separate out the uh, University Village uh, item as well as the um, employment contract. The employment contract? Yeah. Okay. So if nobody else says anything, I'm going to ask for a motion to approve the purchases, the Moose Tower remodel schematic, and the mass spectrometer schematic. So moved. Second. Okay. Is there any discussion on the purchases, the Moose Tower remodel, or the mass spectrometer schematic design? If not, those in favor of passing those consent items indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? They pass. Uh, so we have two items, University Village LLC and the contract for hire. And I guess what I would like to do is let's just take the first one first. Let's get a motion on the table for one of them. I think the University Village LLC, so and then we'll discuss it. So moved. Second. We we'll moved and seconded that uh, a motion to pass the University Village LLC, and what that really is is giving the authority to form an LLC. Correct. That's correct. And that is on the table. And um, I guess Regent Shu, since you asked about it, maybe we should ask you what your uh, items of interest are on that, and we'll see if we can uh, respond. I don't know who might respond at the table. Or senior vice president. Okay, Regent Shu. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> My concern about this is, you know, we've received quite a few memos on this, I think three. Um, I'm still having a hard time understanding why this is coming up now and what, uh, what exactly we need to do and what our real vision is for the property. Um, it looks like we're trying to uh, prepare it 
not, uh, I mean, I think it says here that we're trying to um, create a um, investment vehicle or, or a acquisition vehicle so to protect us from uh, uh, risks, including environmental concerns. And uh, it's not clear to me uh, how we have a purchase price and not, uh, not understand what the environmental issues are. That's the first thing. The second thing is really, um, if we're trying to prepare this uh, vehicle for um, future partnership, I'd like to understand why and you know what what uh, we're trying to do with it because I think we've been asked or told that this uh, property would be purchased with uh, university funds. So um, I don't know why we would need to uh, have a partner associated with this project. Okay, Senior Vice President Burnett, do you want to? Decalos, or you want me to? Um, I, I can certainly uh, talk about this and invite General Counsel Peterson as well because we've been collaborating on this transaction for quite some time. Regent Shu, um, there is a purchase contract in place that we've informed the board on that the university is a party to. We continue to do our due diligence on this project. Um, it is there will be no purchase without specific board authorization. All we're asking for today is to create the vessel or the vehicle by which we may choose to acquire it in a certain fashion. And there are advantages that we've laid out in those memos to the board about why our general counsel believes this is the right fashion to go. It is a timing issue. We have a closing date coming in November. So we are trying to get the vessel ready, fill in all the details to bring you for review action in October should we move forward with this acquisition. But the final details are not available today because we continue to do the due diligence and continue to make sure that we have all the unknowns known before we bring it to this body for action. Any, uh, Regent Rocha. Um, unless Regent Shu has a follow-up. Uh, no, that's good for now. Um, Mr. Chair, um, the information that we have received and the, the feedback that we have received on this um, d does not support the need to make this decision today. Um, I'm very concerned. Uh, I'm going to try to be very measured here. Um, I, I don't want an advocacy coming from council. I want a review coming from council. And in this instance, um, the, the, the problem that I have with this particular posture is the slippery slope into a decision. We make a we move to create this vessel, uh, which provides the momentum and the implication that we have decided that this vessel is the proper way for the university to hold this property. In which case, the university might not even be holding the property, which I would find to be extremely troubling. The creation of the LLC, I, I could go on my phone right now and before you conclude the information items, I can create an LLC. That's, that's not really a, a functional uh, problem for this, this enterprise. In fact, if we think that we have information that will convince this board um, that we should be putting university money into, an, into a piece of property and then somehow the university has some limited capacity to control that property, even though we have put all of the money forward for that property, provided that's the way that we're going to be advised and this board can be convinced to move that way. <clears throat> we can have all of the information, uh, all of the documents necessary to provide that vehicle the capacity to do that, and at which point we could approve that at the same time as approving the vehicle, and by the next day we would have the LLC and the documents supporting it. We don't have to, there, there, it doesn't give us a strategic advantage to do that today. Um, and and I, I think it's problematic that we are being asked to make that determination with virtually no information that we can rely on as to what the structure is going to be, who the partner is going to be, who is going to own what. And it, it, I, I just, I'm, I'm, I'm troubled with how this came forward. I don't understand the review action need at this point. Because as you say, it's November. This is not November. Um, and so from that standpoint, I think this is premature um, to be asking the board to do this um, when we could, we could take this action at the same time as we have meaningful information that would inform the reason to do this. 
there's no reason for us to create this. If anything, we're wasting a filing fee on behalf of the people of the state of Minnesota if we ultimately decide that that's not the way this thing should be owned. So um, I'm, I'm very disappointed with how this is brought forward. I'm disappointed with the lack of a balanced analysis uh, from a legal standpoint as to where this thing is going, because certainly I would you know, expect that we would know uh, that it, 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 it's not prudent to make decisions about um, ownership of a very significant asset in our neighborhood with a complete lack of this data and information as to who owns what. And, and the only thing that I know right now is that the university is putting its money toward buying this property. But I have no idea whether the expectation is the university will control the title, will own it long term. And until we know that, I don't think we should be taking any action. And, and to the extent that we're simply authorizing the creation of an LLC that can be used in the future, that, that takes two minutes to do that portion of it. And I don't want us to take the action now, which then again creates the momentum and gives the, the impression that the board has already made a decision that that's the proper way to go. I, I, I'm going to vote against this. I think it's a very bad uh, um, precedent for us to, to take, and I think we should be getting better information than this. Regional Mari. Um, thank you, Chair Anderson. I actually would uh, uh, yield to administrative response. Uh, what was just commented, I think that's warranted. General Council Peterson. Or Ben, Doug can come. I'm, I'm in Region Chair Anderson, if I may, I, I might start. What we are doing is simply trying to put a framework in place that would facilitate the potential for acquisition of this property. Um, that's it. There is no university money going into this until the Board of Regents agrees that there's university money going into it. And we would bring you, uh, when it's ready, the elements of the LLC that would guide your judgment as to whether or not we should we should buy this. I approved this moving forward because I thought it was a simple step that would enable us to move with uh, a little more alacrity uh, later on. But if the majority of the board is opposed to that particular strategy, we certainly can work around that. Do I understand this correct, uh, General Counsel Peterson? We're forming a vehicle to make a purchase. Nothing happens whether we control the land, somebody else controls the land, um, until this board, what percentages of the partnerships in this would approve that. Am, am I correct in that assumption? That's correct, Chair Anderson. We have to approve everything eventually down the road. Correct. Okay. Uh, Regent Beeson was on uh, next. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, if you step back the uh, from the strategic side, most of the time we buy property and uh, we clear it and we sit on it. It becomes a, a burden. This property we've been talking about are offline for a while has a potential to become an earning asset immediately. This is all subject to final due diligence, and I, I don't feel at all compelled to uh, vote either way on it based on the act that we're taking today of simply uh, forming the entity that could be in place should we do this. Uh, but I, I'm more focused on um, the potential uh, that uh, that this asset can create for the university. We've got a great uh, seller in place who's a friend of the universities. Um, we've made a major investment in 2407. Uh, I told the previous administration 10 years ago we should be more aggressive about um, um, partnering with business. Uh, and I, so I like the potential of having a partner on this property. If we decide to do it ourselves, we'll do that. But I don't see any reason not to approve this, uh, and uh, I appreciate the heads up that progress is getting made and that we've got the potential for a project uh, to come back to us uh, later in the fall. Regent McMillan. Thank you, Chair Anderson. I'm uh, of a largely similar view to uh, Regent Beeson and Regent Rocha, while I appreciate your slippery slope concerns those are those 
at times are real, and I appreciate it when people call them out. I don't feel like I'm stepping onto a slippery slope. I feel like I could quite easily reverse course here, and so that's where I stand. Um, General Counsel Peterson, is it my correct understanding that we could also dissolve this corporation in a heartbeat, so to speak, should the environmental review not go the way we want, should the partnership not pan out? I mean, we could we could undo this too. We're not taking any irrevocable step here. Is that correct? General You're Counsel? correct, Regent McMillan. It's at your direction. Mr. Chair? I think Regional Mari is still wanted to speak or do you defer? I can wait. It's fine. Regional Rosha. Thank you, Mr. Chair. J just to be clear, I, th I think we should seek to acquire the property if the data you know, is supported. I, you know, we are in a tough spot when it comes to property and, and, and to the extent that it makes sense financially and so on. I think that's something that we should very much pursue. Um, I just want to make clear that you know, as, as I read the arguments, whether it's environmental concerns and this somehow protects the university, I mean, this LLC is going to have a $43 million and growing asset. I would certainly hope that the environmental risk is not in excess of that. So we're really not protecting those resources. Um, all the arguments that I saw in the, in the proposal certainly would support a university ownership. Um, and, and, uh, and, and I want to make sure, again, that you make those arguments based in, in support of a joint or LLC type separate entity ownership, which of course then I would like to know the legal implications for our control of the title 50 years from now when we would have an opportunity perhaps to um, use that for an academic enterprise. Um, those specific arguments support acquiring the property. They don't necessarily support providing it to a third entity. And I just want to make sure if, if, if you, I'm, I'm going to vote no, as you know, I could move to table, but let's not belabor the point. If you vote yes, I want to be very clear that that is not endorsing the argument uh, to proceed this way and that the, 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 the format of the entity, whether it's the university on its own or whether it's through uh, an LLC wholly owned by the university or whether it's in another form, that needs to stand on its own merit when it comes back before this board. But I, I, I do want to say I'm very disappointed with the way the information was provided. And I, I ask follow-up questions and I continue to get advocacy as opposed to analysis. Regent Shu. Thank you, Chair Anderson. Um, for me, I think it's really a case of information asymmetry. Some of us just don't have as much information as other people do about what this transaction is uh, supposed to do. And when, when this type of stuff shows up on our docket and then we ask questions and we get memos from the general counsel um, and, and senior vice president about what this is and yet the questions really don't seem to be answered in, in my mind in terms of what our ultimate goal here is. I'm told on one hand we want we want a partner for this deal, uh, yet we don't need a partner. And for me, it's it's that, that's the real discussion that we're not actually going to have until it's all buttoned up and tied, you know, tied with a bow and wrapped up and tied with a bow that we're going to have that discussion. And I think at that point it's a little bit, you know, too late. Uh, we're going to be voting yes or no on something. Uh, but I think that we deserve to have a better idea of what this transaction is and what we what we plan to do about it. You know, Regent Chu, I, I can take some of the blame for that. I, I brought in on this a month ago. It's, it's I'm the chair of this committee. Um, I try to pass on the information that I can. I know we've had a couple times, three memos. Um, I guess I'm not privy to who calls. Uh, I received zero calls from anybody asking me about what I know. Um, I've formed LLCs a lot. I, I you know, Regent Rosha has, has some validity to what he's saying in my business experience that it can be done in a heartbeat on LLC, but I also think we have partners that are wondering, is your board willing to do this? Is your board, you know, potential partners. I don't say we have partners because we, we have potential. Um, and I also believe that if we had a partner where we own 90%, we'd put in $9 and the partner would put in one. I mean, it's not that it's gonna be all university money, um, but I'll take I'll take part of that blame. Uh, Regional Mari, you still uh, have to talk? You know, Mr. Chairman, for the sake of time, I am good. Uh, I look forward to more conversation at another day. Regent McMillan. Thank you, Chair Anderson. I just, again, wanna reiterate, I'm not in any way committing to a future outcome here. What I'm committing to is 
what appears to be keeping a range of creative options open in a public-private perspective that we still don't know whether they make sense or not. And, and I, two other thoughts unrelated to that. One is I viewed the general counsel's role in this is to help us keep matters that need to be privileged and confidential, privileged and confidential, and not advocacy. And, and uh, Chair Anderson, I don't know that you have anything to apologize for. We, the, the commercial real estate market is complicated. And uh, public-private partnerships are complicated and hard. And they may not make the most sense here. But I don't prejudge any of that. If we can do it ourselves, good gracious, we better do it ourselves. But there could be a whole lot of reasons why doing it with a private sector party might make tremendously more sense. I just don't know. So I'm Regent Rosha. I'm not prejudging anything pro or con. I'm just authorizing them to go forward to do something that looks uh, like keeping all of our creative and economic options open. So that's where I stand as a regent here. Regent Cohen, you had your hand up. Yes. I, <clears throat> thanks, Chair Anderson. I just wondered if our general counsel had, had any words of wisdom or, or enlightenment about the, the situation. And I don't want to put you on the spot either if, if you don't. Uh, Chair Anderson, Regent Cohen, thank, thank you for that invitation. Um, I do want to sort of couch this in terms of what I believe um, has been the spirit of this from Executive Vice President Burnett's spot, as well as the people that are working with him on this potential transaction, which for um, Executive Vice President Burnett and everybody else in administration working on this still has a lot of the questions that all of you are are touching upon. This is a, a potential transaction. We are sort of on a, on a march towards a well-organized assessment and due diligence process about how this should be structured. We're in discussions with uh, another potential partner. We have questions about that. They have questions about the structure that we would use to implement a potential plan. And so from my point of view and from the point of view of everybody that I've kind of discussed this with um, in administration, I think the philosophy has been that, yes, as Chair McMillan points out, this is a, a complicated transaction. It involves a lot of money, um, and it's a, a strategic location for the University of Minnesota. So what we've been trying to do um, with the various memos starting in early July is keep you apprised of the steps along the way that we are hoping to undertake to keep the process moving. Is it essential that we form an LLC today? Would that be a deal breaker if you directed that we do it in October? The answer is no, but on the other hand, in our conversations with you know, the potential partners, et cetera, and in sort of all the things that have to be planned with regard to this transaction. It helps to have some of these, you know, tasks on the potential checklist um, worked on and checked off and to kind of have more concrete discussions about them with whatever investment dollars are coming into the transaction. And I want to emphasize that um, we do not want to come to you um, you know, in um, November um, with, you know, the fully baked plan that answers all the questions you have. But at that point, um, it's fully baked and you'll be presented with a yes, no question with the closing date a week away. Um, what we're trying to do is keep you apprised, get permission for each step along the way, plenty of ways to do a 180. We can dissolve this LLC. We can take your direction that we should not do this um, in any event once you hear the, you know, how this evolves over time. We fully respect your discretion as regents to make those decisions. But we thought that rather than wait until we have answers to all the questions, which won't give you much time to assess it, it's better that we um, do this in a staged process, um, asking you for permission for you know, the steps that do not place the university at unreasonable risk, but giving you plenty of room, let's say at the October meeting, to learn um, what we know then about how we might 
employ this LLC, and at that time you can direct us to dissolve it, do it according to Plan A or Plan B, however you'd like to design it. So it is really an effort to try to um, keep you involved in a in a undefined and evolving process. Thank you. I think we, we've had enough discussion. We've talked about it. I think everybody kind of knows where they feel. Uh, we've got a motion on the table to form an LLC for the uh, purpose of, of purchasing this asset. Um, at this time, I'm going to call for the vote. All those in favor of forming that LLC today signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Nope. Hey. Motion carries. Thank you. Regent Shu, you had one more item, and that was on the uh, contract for hire for the Vice President of Equity and Diversity, I guess, before I ask you to comment. I would like somebody to put the motion on the table. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Hire, Mr. Chairman. Okay. It's been moved and seconded for the uh, hiring of the Vice President for Equity and Diversity. Uh, Regent Shu. Yes, thank you, Chair Anderson. Um, my comment is really that I'm, I'm disappointed that um, now that we're in a presidential transition that we're going out and hiring people and uh, doing things that, you know, this is an L, L uh, level hire and uh, I have nothing against Michael Go. I, I, I know him a little bit. Um, I think if the president wants to hire him, the president could have hired him, you know, months ago and not had to uh, go through a search and create a additional costs involved with, um, with this uh, promotion, if you will, and I just would, I know we have other searches ongoing and I want to just make clear that I don't think we should be going forward with these until we identify a new president. So. Fair statement. Any other comments? Regent uh, McMillan. Thank you, Chair Anderson, and uh, thank you, Regent Shu, for articulating what I think is a, uh, a valid concern as we as we embark on a on a transition year, and you and I have had some significant dialogue around this, but let me give you my perspective. And I think across the range of, I guess we call them Class L or Category L officers, I think there are some, and, and President Kaler himself has talked about some of those that clearly would be on the end of the spectrum that would only be in the purview of a new president to hire. And I think on the other end of that range are some that, uh, that to me at least, to this member of the board, are fundamentally important across the transition year and will help a new president succeed because they involve duties and roles that I think should be hallmarks of what we as a board and the administration want, regardless of who the president is. And specifically with respect to Vice President Go, I've I think what we have here is we're not going out and finding a, you know, somebody from the University of, of Boston who's never been here, a high-risk external hire that we'd be making on the cusp of changing presidents. I would never support that. But I think where we have a proven leader with a strong track record, both on the faculty and the administration side of the organization, and I think given the fact that we want to move forward in this vitally important area with a range of key initiatives right now, whether it's campus climate, external community engagement, uh, the core pipeline, I just, I, I find myself on the end of the spectrum of L-level officers that this is one that makes sense. And we're getting a very proven and known commodity. And lastly, it's an at-will appointment. And uh, when I think about all those things, just to give you my sense of where I stand, that's why I'm supportive of this, but I'd, I want to really acknowledge the underlying substance of what you're raising, and that is these all observe, deserve additional attention, and I believe President Kaler is, is doing that. I can speak for um, Vice Chair Powell. We've had considerable discussion with President Kaler about this one. He supports it as well. And uh, so I'm speaking in, on his behalf as well in his absence here. So. We have given thought. You've enlightened the conversation. I appreciate it. And I'm just responding to you with, I think, what you already knew how I feel. But I want the rest of the board to hear that as well. Regent BC. Thank you, Mr. Can I, I respond? The, the, I'll yield to Regent. Regent Chu, I'm sorry. I didn't see you. Oh, thank you. Um, I appreciate uh, uh, your thoughts, uh, Regent McMillan. I, I, um, you, I think you made my case, basically. We hired the guy that was already here. But there was a chance, because we had a search out there, that we would end up with someone moving here from 
Boston or California or wherever, uh, only to possibly be moving on in less than a year. And I think, I think that was just kind of a bad timing situation that we could have controlled better. Um, and, you know, I do, I do think you're right about Dr. Go, and he, you know, he has a lot of ideas um, <clears throat> about what, uh, what needs to happen in the next year, and um, I think it'll work out just fine. But my point is that, you know, we did pay a search firm. You know, as you know, the Minnesota Daily is crabbing about uh, the, the cost of the presidential search already, and it hasn't even started yet. So um, I just think we need to be mindful of how we're spending um, uh, money um, on these searches. Point of clarification, Chair Anderson. Uh, President Kaler will yield to you. Thank you. We did not use a search firm for this search. Okay. Well, in that case, <laughs> in that case, the the money wasn't uh, an issue isn't an issue for me. But the issue is that we could have, we could be in a situation where we're bringing in someone from outside for a very short period of time, which I think would have been a mistake. Regent Beeson. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I certainly agree with. Regent uh, Chair McMillan, the, I think our leadership's already shown um, good judgment uh, on a position of the provost uh, who, uh, whose replacement uh, will be decided by the, by the next president. And I think for a senior vice president level, that's, that, that is clearly, uh, uh, are clearly cases where if this were to, these all things were to occur, we would want to defer to the next president. But I, I think at the vice president level, it's a case by case, uh, and with a strong candidate like Dr. Go, who's been on the job, uh, we've looked at the other resumes that have come in. Uh, I think this is the right decision. Thank you, uh, Regent Rocha. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I don't, I don't feel as strongly as as my colleague Regent Chu about the implications of the permanence. Um, although I would suggest that the arguments. Um, related to the effectiveness and so on, I, I, I would certainly have expected Dr. Go, Vice President Go, to, to provide all of those with the interim tag just as well as the permanent tag. I don't know that there would be a difference there. Um, and, and I, but just a couple of, I, I, I guess it's a little more than housekeeping, but a couple of, of, of things as I'm analyzing um, this is that when we're talking about these kinds of decisions, and I, in, in a, I, I certainly would think that all of us would agree that this has, this sort of academic conversation has in, in no way a reflection of Dr. Goh's exceptional qualities and abilities and, and, and so on. But um, I just want to ensure that as we look at these kinds of things, matters that would come before this entire board, I think the board's perspective as a whole is important to understand um, in that it's not being sort of decision by just a couple of folks uh, because by the time it gets here, our, our hands are somewhat tied. We could have, I, I certainly wasn't part of a conversation as to how we were going to handle uh, board approvals in this period. Um, uh, prior to the, the transition of the president. Um, and, and so I just, I think that's important and I haven't really had an opportunity to express that to anybody because uh, I haven't had any of those conversations. Um, the other thing, um, as we look at the information that's provided to us in these, in these uh, hires, um, and of course you guys understand that, or you've heard me before talk about these issues about compensation and, and some of the downstream effects and the long-term effects of that, um, when we're looking at the comparable market data, I don't, I don't know what the predecessor was paid. Two forty-one was the was the predecessor. Yeah, because that's not in this, and so I'll, I'm, I'm going to call you from now on um, to understand where we are. If we're making changes one way or the other, that's a good news story, obviously. But when we talk about percentiles, um, I, I want to be careful about looking at percentiles as a justification because that's assuming that the percentiles are where they should be in the first place. So. Just, just want, those are just a couple of things as we go forward with this. I congratulate Vice President Go, um, and again, the fact that it, the contract is at will and so on. I, I don't think it's it's a draconian thing, but I do think it's an important conversation that we have as a board to ensure that we are moving together in this very, very important time with uh, uh, President Kaler um, having a successful final year. Thank you, Regent Johnson. You want to take us home on this? Or? Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, I fully support uh, approving this contract with Dr. Go, but it, there's more to it than that. We are, in a sense, in an interim position right now. Dr. Kaler is our president uh, until June of 2019, July 1st of 2019. 
But the pitfall that I see in organizations, whether it's the University of Minnesota, business, military, church, when you have an interim period, you start to put the brakes on. Folks, we can't start to put brakes on. We've got to go full steam ahead for this university, and it's at the senior level that's very, very important. It sends a strong signal throughout the entire university community that we're live, we're well, we're open for business, and we want, want to move forward. So I, it was vetted and uh, was uh, brought by the administration for our consideration, and I would uh, urge a strong uh, vote of affirm, affirmation. Thank you. Thank you, and I guess uh, you're not gonna bring us home as Regional Mari, you wanted to I will be something? very, very brief, um, okay. uh, and I will not just harp on how much I appreciate Dr. Go and how talented he is. I'll actually take it from a non-personal perspective. One is, um, I was a student when we had our last interim uh, vice president for equity and diversity for approximately two years. Um, and this, if we kept an interim, would be about 18 months. Um, and what I saw was a deterioration of an office and of the work being done. And so I actually vehemently support uh, hiring someone in this role at this time because it does run a significant risk of undoing work. Uh, or not moving forward work that needs to be done. And so as an undergrad and master's student, I saw what that looked like, and I would hate for that to happen uh, this time around as well. Thank you. At this time, we've got a motion on the floor to hire uh, Dr. Go as the Vice President for Equity and Diversity, and you've got an employment agreement in front of you. I'm gonna ask all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries, thank you. We do have the last thing is information items and uh, I am just gonna say what they are, uh, Senior Vice President Burnett, because they're all in the in the uh, book and as much as we love you here, we've heard enough Sorry from you today. Um, okay, um, where are the information items? There's the annual asset management report, investment advisory committee update, quarterly purchasing report. There's an update on 2642 University Avenue. Law school metrics and targets, and yesterday the Debt Management Advisory Committee met, and there's an update in there. So with that, if there's no further discussion, I'll entertain a motion for adjournment. So moved. Is there a second? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Aye. Adjourned. Thank you.